A few items of business before we start the meeting. Uh, I'm going to ramble for a paragraph or two. Uh, could people find their seats? When I started on the Appropriations Committee in 1984, our town budget was $4 million, and we could review items in detail during town meeting. Now it's uh, upwards of uh, $70, $80 million. As our town has grown, it's harder to digest all of the items during town meeting. We no longer have the luxury of contemplating every detail during the meeting and must prepare earlier. The responsible citizen vets articles during committee hearings and shares his objections with the committee so they can deliberate and respond with a tested solution. Streamlining town meeting is first about preparation and involvement through the rest of the year. Our committees hold hearings and deliberate, and you need to get involved with that. And they educate about their actions taken during their meetings, not only at their meetings, but civic groups like Educate Hopkinton and the Hopkinton Women's Club give them a popular forum to educate. The selectmen and town manager have done a wonderful job in organizing the warrant for clarity. But once the meeting begins, our options are narrower. The consent calendar dispenses with non-controversial articles and articles that have not matured enough for a meaningful motion in time for town meeting. I work with presenters to assure terse presentations, but I will not penalize a committee for a rambling presentation if the content is important to the town. I exhort you town meeting members to finish talking as, as soon as you can. So if you're finished in 30 seconds, you don't have to fill the other minute and a half to bring it up to two minutes, uh, unless you've got something good to say. Um, I will not deny you a full two minutes simply because you're, you, you can't come to the point, but please try to be terse. I think you've, I've, I, I love this town meeting. I would have to say that uh, for the most part, you all do a wonderful job and we invite everybody to get involved. Uh, before uh, we begin, we have uh, a few things to do. I'm gonna start with um, a salute to the flag led by our, our veterans, by Mike Shepard. Can you present the colors? Detail, present the colors. Please join me in the salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, please remain standing. We have three of our high school students. Uh, can you guys introduce yourselves? Uh, going to sing the uh, national anthem. I'm Nick Sista. I'm Olivia Kershey. And I'm Miranda Bauman. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets right Flag 
going to ask the, uh, the color guard and our students to hang on for just a little bit. Before town meeting, I would like to honor an outstanding citizen who has shown by example how to serve the town. This year, uh, the Moderators Award Committee, which consists of uh, my deputy moderator, Muriel Kramer, our town clerk, Brenda McCann, myself, and the previous awardees, have chosen this special person uh, to be this year's Moderator Award winner. We'll leave you uh, hanging for a bit because I think uh, Mr. Shepard has a few words to say about the winner. Sarah, Susie. <clears throat> uh, please be seated. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Um, I was asked to do this uh, because the recipient is a good friend and, and a well-respected colleague in town. I, I hope you all can hear me. Um, <clears throat> unsung hero. The, the textbook definition is one who does great deeds but receives little or no recognition for them. Well, the town moderator has tried to recognize these citizens over the past few years by way of the moderator's award usually awarded at the beginning of town meeting, just like tonight. I was approached by the moderator, and I'm honored to present this award to an individual who has lived his entire life in Hopkinton. He's a Marine Corps veteran. He's the father of two beautiful daughters, Susie and Sarah. He's this year's, this year's recipient, works in the JFK building in Boston as a veteran services officer uh, for the American Legion. He's the adjutant of our local post 202, American Legion post, and a past president and current chaplain of the local <clears throat> Marine Corps po uh, League and, uh, detachment in Natick. He's a charter member of the Veterans Celebration Committee. The committee, which was organized in 2002, <clears throat> as you probably know, organizes Memorial Day activities such as the addresses at the cemeteries, the march, and the speeches at the gazebo afterwards. This gentleman personally assures that every veteran has a fresh flag on his grave every Memorial Day, which may sound like a small task, but there are over 600 flags, and he has to organize the, the Brownies, the Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts to help him do this, and it's a, a, a really gratifying endeavor. Um, <clears throat> most of us proudly remember Susie and Sarah's participation at these events, from a very young age. He helped organize the TAPS vigil, which recognizes those town veterans that are no longer with us. He plans and coordinates the annual Veterans Day ceremony on November 11th each year. He participates in the monthly veterans breakfast that takes place at the Senior Center. Primarily, the, one of the more important things, at least from my perspective, is this gentleman, upon learning of the passing of a Hopkinton veteran, calls all the Legion members so that they may go to the funeral home as a, as a unit and say goodbye to their fallen comrade. Mike does this every time and way too often. Um, <clears throat> having done all this, it's important to know that he's also a great stonemason. When it was discovered there may be a time capsule under the cornerstone of the Korean church, this gentleman <clears throat> volunteered to remove the stone, recover the capsule, replace the stone, and the church didn't fall down. It was all good. <coughs> we benefited from the contents of this, the time capsule at the 300th uh, celebration, as you may recall. He, on his own, also buried another time capsule in the center piece of the gazebo on the floor. You can see it there today. 
um, <clears throat> for future generations to discover. Um, on, a, on a personal note, when I left the Marine Corps in 1973, a colonel who I very much respected, and I'll never forget it, told me that just because you're taking off the uniform, you're always going to be a Marine. <clears throat> Michael Whalen, come on up here, Mike, has always lived up to this advice. I'm proud to call him a friend and have the honor of recognizing <coughs> his many contributions to our community. Semper Fidelis, Mike. Thank you. Semper Mike. Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm sure everybody knows that uh, the, this town is um, flush with volunteers, um, and to be uh, singled out uh, for this it, it is very important to me. And uh, uh, you know, I'm very moved by it. All these little projects that I do, uh, I've had plenty of help throughout the years. Legion members, the rest of the members on the committee, and of course, uh, my two daughters, who I will now try to embarrass a little and say uh, that I'm very proud of them for all the things that they've done over the years to help me out. Thank you. Thank you. And we are ready to begin town meeting. Thank you all. That was lovely. I'm always impressed when I hear a guy that can carry the, the base. <laughs> Counters have been assigned under the able direction of Muriel Kramer. And we have the list. We have a list. Uh, we won't go through all that, but uh, before we have any standing votes, we'll get that to you. Uh, before the meeting we start, start uh, the handouts are in the corridor. People have the annual report, the motions document, the appropriations report. Uh, rules of the meeting. Non-voters should have a white pass and sit in the first rows to my right. Media sits in the middle and the front. Voters should have a orange pass um, and sit in the rest of the auditorium. Uh, no standing um, in the aisles during the meeting, no eating, drinking, or smoking in the building. No one should operate a computer, beeper, or cell phone during the meeting. Only registered voters are entitled to sit in the voting areas of the hall. The exceptions are town councils, Ray Mearias and Eric Russell, our director of land use, and uh, town operations, Elaine Lars, are actually the rest of our uh, employed uh, non, uh, uh, non Hopkintonians are sitting uh, with the, um, the non voters, um, with the exception of uh, our superintendent and, our, uh, and Ray Dumas, our. Um, Uh, uh, Ralph Dumas, excuse me, uh, our finance director. I don't see, uh, and, and Dr. McLeod is there too. Okay, good. Um, any person desiring to speak and wanting recognition should raise, should rise and come to a microphone. We have microphones in the front here. Um, when recognized by the moderator, state your name and address. The best speaker makes his point with the fewest excess phrases, shortest arguments win the most undecided voters, long speeches irritate and lose votes. No one speaks unless recognized by the moderator or continues to talk when asked by the moderator to stop. No one speaks more than two minutes without the approval of the moderator. No person should speak more than twice without approval from the moderator. No debating, all questions come through the moderator. 
No one stands except to address the moderator or to vote. And when it comes to uh, a standing count, all voters must raise their orange voting pass to be counted. Always speak to the article under discussion and not to the motivations, heritage, or personal habits of those opposed to your view. People with bad breath and poor grooming may hold valid opinions. If you have an amendment, state it, then write it, and present it to the amendment desk in the rear. Josh, are you there? There he is. So if you have an amendment, give it to uh, uh, Josh in the back. Uh, remain civil while making your point. Make your best effort to understand the objections to your viewpoint. Contrary viewpoints strengthen our ultimate decisions. We all benefit from the debate of the issues. Listen to the full range of arguments so that together we can find the best possible course for the town. Now we are ready to start the meeting. Our town clerk, Brenda McCann, will give us the call and return of the warrant. Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Town of Hopkinton, Annual Town Meeting Warrant, Monday, May 2, 2016. Middlesex County, to any of the constables of the Town of Hopkinton in said county. Greetings. In the name of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you are hereby required to notify and warn all inhabitants of the Town of Hopkinton qualified to vote in elections and in town affairs. To bring in their ballots on Monday, May 16, 2016, to an adjourned session of the annual town meeting to be held at the Hopkinton Middle School Gymnasium for the election of numerous officers. And further, to meet at the Hopkinton Middle School Auditorium at 88 Hayden Row on Monday, May 2, 2016, at 7 p.m., then and there, to act upon the following articles. Hereof fail not, and make the due return of this warrant with your doings thereon to the clerk of said town of Hopkinton at the time and place aforesaid. Given under our hands this fifth day of April, 2016, signed by the Board of Selectmen. Date, April 15, 2016. I hereby certify that I have served the foregoing warrant by posting a true and attested copy thereof in the townhouse in each of the churches in town, in each of the post offices, and in each of the Indian houses of the town at least eight days prior to the time of holding said town meeting. Signed by Patrick O'Brien, Constable of Hopkinton. And the first order of business I, uh, is to uh, appoint the moderator. Excuse me. Not yet. Not yet. There'll be time. First order of business is to appoint a deputy moderator. I uh, nominate Muriel Kramer. And do I hear a second? All right. All in favor? Aye. And opposed? That's the only, that's pretty good. Muriel, unanimous. I didn't give them time to think, it's all right. <laughs> uh, Did I call the meeting to order? Okay. It's been pointed out to me, I may not have called the meeting to order. I'm calling the meeting to order. <laughs> the time and uh, we're ready to go. Um, Mr. Polico. Mr. Moderator, I move the town vote to adjourn the annual town meeting this evening at the conclusion of the article under discussion at 11 o'clock p.m. and to reconvene at the Hopkinton Medical School Auditorium at 88 Hayden Rose Street at 7 p.m. tomorrow, May 3rd, 2016. So, so motion to complete the article under discussion at 11 and adjourn to the, tomorrow night at 7. Second, and um, any discussion, all in favor? And opposed, and it's unanimous, and so carries. Uh, any Mr. other uh, changes in customary procedure need to be addressed now. Thank you, Kathy Laflash, 45 Proctor Street. I'm a member of the personnel committee. I'd like to move that they change the order of business and consider Article 51 after Article 7 this evening. 
both articles pertain to the town clerk position as a sponsor of the personnel committee, and we'd like them to s discuss in that order if possible. Okay. The usual reason for changing the order is to clarify an issue, and that sounds like it, uh, it meets that. Uh, is, there's a second. Is there? A second. Yeah, I heard that. Um, <laughs> with a second, a second. It's all over the place. Um, any discussion? Hearing none, we're ready for a vote. All in favor of moving Article 51 for discussion following Article 7, signify by saying aye. aye. And opposed. And it's unanimous and so carries. Uh, Do we have uh, a listing of the consent calendar? Is this it? Those are the counters. Counters. Okay. For the last few years, we have uh, been working with the consent calendar. I'll describe what it does, and I will tell you what the motions on the consent calendar uh, are. Uh, we have, I can't see your numbers here. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, I would now entertain a motion to take uh, the following requested actions on all of the articles listed on the consent calendar. Now, those are, I will list those articles for you and then we'll get a description of the articles. Uh, article 3, Article 5, Article 25, Article 26, Article 27, Article 29, Article 45, and Article 52. And we'll go through each of those. Let me, uh, let me just get that here. Excuse me, I misspoke. Is that 3, 5, 26, 27, 29, 45, and 52? I misspoke. 3, 5, 26, 27, 29, 45, and 52. Uh, uh, take a look at those very quickly. Three is budget transfers, and there weren't any. Article 5 is uh, the usual property tax exemption increase, um, which is actually um, the, the, excuse me? Identical, I, uh, identical to previous years. Article uh, 26. is um, the storage facility feasibility study. Um, Article 27 is the artificial turf field. Article 29 is a transfer of funds for new capital projects. Excuse me? All three of those. There, there were no action taken by the respective committees. Uh, Article 45. I'm sorry, I didn't memorize what the article numbers. It was a gift of land. There was no action taken on that. And then finally, Article 52 uh, was the uh, trust, uh, trustees of the school trust fund in the town of Hopkinton. There was. Uh, no, 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 no action. No, Gene Bernadin to get to be appointed. So wait a sec, why are we pulling it? No, we're just putting it on the consent. Oh, yeah, oh, it's so just appointing, appointing somebody that's already... Yeah. Okay. 
Is everybody clear on the articles that are on the consent calendar? These are basically um, not an issue. If you have an issue, come to the mic quickly. Yeah. Uh, Steve Pop is 24 Cedar Street Extension. Can you remind me what a consent, what this means? So what happens is we, uh, the non-controversial articles are put on the consent calendar. You can vote them all as a block. Um, and. Uh, to be passed as listed in the, uh, the motion's warrant. Uh, most of these are no action. And um, what it does is it just, when we come to that article, we don't have to go through this each time with each of the articles. Okay? Frank Terso, 173 Saddle Hill Road. For the sake of clarity, could you have these listed on the screen of all the uh, articles that are in the consent? Uh, can you put that up there, uh, Josh? So let me just give them to you again. 3, 5, 26, 27, 29, 45, and 52. Sandy? Uh, Mr. Moderator, just a quick question. Now, all of these articles, there's no action taken, and they're, in effect, being withdrawn? In effect. What, there's, there's one which is to appoint somebody that's already, what? Number five. Oh, if number five is the tax increase, but uh, uh, what are the things listed in those? It's tax exemptions for, um, uh, An appointment, An appointment for, the for Jean Bernadin. Yeah. Okay. So I would now entertain a motion to take the requested actions on all of the articles listed on the consent calendar. Frank? I'm sorry, I, I don't see a list on the screen yet. And okay. I, I'd like to see a complete list, and I don't feel comfortable unless I do. I don't know how other people feel. Okay. So it's articles 3, 5, 26, 27, 29, 45, and 52. I, yes. In previous years, we've had them all listed out completely, listing which ones they are, which, what they're about, and then you can quickly move through them. Without doing that, I don't think we can quickly move through them. Just I think we should look at them. We need clarity on this. There, no action. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry that um, that slide did not make it. I would now entertain a motion to take the requested actions on all the articles listed on the consent calendar. After the motion is made, I will call out the numbers of the articles one by one. Any voter who would like to ask a question about an article or wishes to hold a debate on an article should say the word hold in a loud voice when the article number is called by the moderator. The moderator will inquire as to whether the request is for a question or for debate. If the purpose of the request is to ask a question, an attempt will be made to quickly obtain a satisfactory answer. If the purpose is to hold the article for debate, the article will be removed from the consent calendar and restored to its original place in the warrant to be moved, debated, and voted in the usual manner. After removing the debatable articles from the consent calendar, the moderator will ask for a motion to take the requested actions on all of the articles remaining on the consent calendar. Are we comfortable now? All right. Article 3. Question? Mr. Yumina. I'm just, or Mike Yumina, 24 Chestnut. I'm not really clear about what you said. In one, one um, time you said that these articles will all be... Um, non-controversial or no action taken. 
Yeah, but I mean, does this mean that they're being put off to another time, or does this just mean you're grouping them all together to pass them all at once? The latter. The latter. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Article 3, anybody unclear on that? Article 5. Article 26. Article 27. Well, hold on Article 27. Article 29. Now, do you have a question on that or do you want it for debate? For debate, both of those? 20, 27 as well? Okay, you want it for debate, okay. Uh, Article 45 and Article 52. Okay, now we're ready to vote on the consent calendar. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed. Do you understand what you're doing by a no vote? Seriously. We're what we're trying to do, and we've done it in previous years, is a very simple thing. We've got a series of votes, a series of articles, that you can, uh, you, uh, that they're sort of no-brainers. There's no action taken by the committee, or there, there are things that are motherhood and apple pie, and everybody has passed them in the past, and we do it as a sort of pro forma thing. If you have a specific issue on one of these articles, we give you the opportunity when I list them for you to pull the article. To let us go through all of that and say that you're, you're now confused is really not terribly democratic. Mr. Moderator, may I move that we vote the consent agenda on Article 3, 5, 26, 45, and 52? Those are the, the only ones that are left. Correct. So can we... But that's what, that's what happens. 27 and 29 are automatically pulled. Right. That's, That are, that are being part of the consent calendar. Right. The ones that have the line through them, right. it's not happening. So if these people are comfortable with us going forward with the ones that are not crossed out, so, then maybe we could get some. Does that clarify it for those who said no? Okay. All right. Now let's, let's try that consent calendar thing again. All in favor of the consent calendar signify by saying aye and opposed. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And thank you for that clarifi clarification, Ms. Wiggins. We can now begin. We have before us Article 1. I think I've got it before me. Mr. Moderator, we move the town accept the reports of town officers, boards, and committees. And coming from the selectman, it needs no second. Uh, before we finish that, we have some town reports. People are going to speak. Ms. Wexlax for the um, Charter Commission. Good evening. I'm Pam Wexlax. And I have the privilege to serve as the chair of the Charter Review Committee in addition to serving on the Appropriation Committee and the Elementary School Building Committee. Our committee is made up of very talented and knowledgeable residents of the town. Michelle Murdoch is our Vice Chair and serves on the 300th Anniversary Committee. Rick Flannery, our Secretary, is a retired Hockington Police Chief and has previously served on the Marathon Committee. Jean Birchman serves on both the School Committee and the 300th Anniversary Committee. Todd Sestari serves on the Board of Selectmen. Kurt Cooprider led a major revision of the Faith Community Church's bylaws. And last but definitely not least, Beth Hurley served on the original Charter Commission when the town decided to pursue this change in home rule in the 2000s. Next slide. 
<laughs> the 2006 Hopkinton Charter requires at least once every 10 years, and in each year ending with a six, the town clerk, in conjunction with the town moderator, the board of selectmen, the appropriation committee, and the school committee, establish a special committee for the purpose of reviewing the charter and to make a report with recommendations for the town meeting concerning any proposed amendments the committee may determine to be necessary or desirable. As such, our committee held its first meeting in January 2016. As this is the first in-depth review of the charter since its inception, the committee determined that the needs of the community would best be met by taking a thoughtful and engaged approach. The fact that any amendments to the charter can only be approved at an annual election in May and that a certain sequence of events must occur prior to that led us to concur that the, ba the town would not be able to vote on any proposed changes until May the May 2017 election ballot. In addition to reviewing the existing charter and comparing it with benchmark communities that are similar and characteristic to Hockington, we are also conducting surveys and interviews with town departments and committees, as well as planning for public hearings during the process. Next slide. As you can see on this slide, we've started engaging in the feedback portion of our timeline. In addition to our current polling of town departments and employee and committees, we are planning two public hearings, one in September and another in November. Our intention is to present our final recommendations at a special town meeting either in late January or early February 2017. Changes must then be reviewed by the Attorney General and are targeted to be placed on the ballot for May 15, 2017 election. By following this timeline, we hope to allow ample time to include all public input and ensure that there is not a significant gap between the town meeting approval and the election. The committee has not determined any positions on changes to the charter of yet and we welcome public input at any time during the process. We are on the town website at the address indicated here, and all of our email addresses are available there as well. As always, our meetings are public and posted in advance, and we welcome public comment at the beginning of every meeting. Thank you, and we look forward to an engaged community as we proceed through this process. Thank you for your work, Pam. That's terrific. Um, Mr. Markey for the Elementary School Building Committee. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Accept them all together. We'll keep this brief, but I, I guess first up, we're not here asking for money, so that's a good news. First time in a few town meetings. Uh, we want to give you a brief update, three minute update on what we've been doing since last fall when the town meeting uh, funded the school building project. Since last fall, we've been getting down to the nuts and bolts of planning needed to enter the construction phase. Uh, the phase we're in is called the design development. It's where the in-depth in site engineering analysis work and detailed design level discussions uh, produce the information needed to complete the picture uh, necessary for beginning the construction, uh, for doing the, the, the construction plans and costs. Uh, first, I guess hats off to the uh, superintendent and our STEM educators because my fourth grader came home from school one day and he said, Daddy, the, the engineering design process is ask, imagine, plan, create, and improve. And I thought, that's, that's, that's great. It, it allowed me to put a framework on the whole thing we've been doing the last few years. <laughs> so we're really deep into the plan phase right now where we're getting all the detailed site, all the detailed uh, building costs together. And our, um, we now have a construction partner on board, uh, Carl Antonio of Holliston. A lot of experience with school buildings, uh, experience with buildings right here in Hopkinton as well. Uh, the ESBC and the extended project team are working together to keep the project in budget and on time while providing everything needed to achieve the district's education plan. So with that, uh, we'd like to give a quick update snapshot on current activities and what you can expect over the next uh, six months or so. Uh, first of all, as far as the schedule goes, we're on track uh, for the opening we all expected in September of 2018 for the full 2018-19 school year at the new facility. 
Uh, the design development package submitted on schedule to the MSBA a couple of weeks ago. The MSBA sends feedback and questions, and we respond before the end of May to those. Also, in the beginning of April, the local board permitting, permitting process took place. Uh, the, the school uh, people have appeared before the Conservation Commission, and they'll be appearing shortly before the planning board. Uh, <clears throat> in June, we expect to have 60% design done uh, by the end of June. Uh, in July and August, we're going to put out early bid packages over the summer in three parts. The first part will be site work and civil utilities. That big bid package will be issued in mid-August of this year. Then there'll be a foundations package issued in September of this year, possibly. And the third one, a structural steel package issued by the end of September. In September, site clearing begins. In October, the full package is issued for the bidding in uh, mid-October. In October of 2016, this year, we expect to have shovels in the ground and construction start. So as far as budget goes, there's really two main uh, components of the budget, which are the site and the building. Uh, based on the more in-depth site engineering uh, work that I mentioned that completed in this phase, and the detailed design planning discussions of the elementary school building committee and extended project team. The site costs at this point are higher than initially budgeted, and the building costs are now lower than initially budgeted. At this point, uh, there's a lot of things in flux, as normal at this stage in, in a project. The cost estimators are seeing uh, weekly fluctuations in construction cost estimates as we work through the site uh, issues and uh, finalized plans for the building and as we approach engaging the uh, regulatory boards in town as well. So I guess the bottom line to, that we're committed to is that we will enter the construction phase in budget. So we're not going to go into the construction phase with any uh, budget total different than what you committed uh, to us to spend last fall. So we're committed to quality building in budget and on time that meets the educational needs of the district. We've directed the project team to move forward with a design that inspires, welcomes, and offers a sense of character uh, for Hopkinton. So thank you for the opportunity to give the update, and please stay tuned for the activities Mike uh, mentioned we're engaging in the next uh, several months. Thank you. There are many more reports in your town report, uh, and uh, we hope that you read them because you've got a lot of fine volunteer work going on. Uh, we have a motion in front of us to accept the town reports. Uh, any objections? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed? And it's unanimous and so carries. Article 2. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Kamalo, uh, actually, this is the Appropriations Committee recommendation. Mr. Manning. Good evening. Article 2, Fiscal Year 2016 Supplemental Appropriations. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Essentially, uh, we have uh, two different pieces to it. First is the fiscal year 16 snow and ice deficit of $200,000. Um, essentially, that'll be used with free cash. And then the second piece is a transfer of uh, sewer retained earnings um, for debt service. And essentially, uh, this is a uh, housekeeping article uh, to write an article that was passed at 2015 ATM. Um, it's this. Uh, article is not indicative of any financial problems with the sewer enterprise fund. It's just housekeeping. Okay. Any questions? I see we're ready for a vote. Article 2 is in front of us for snow and ice. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. And opposed? And it's unanimous and so carries. Article 3 was on the consent calendar. Article 4 unpaid bills from previous fiscal years. This is a little unusual and that it takes a four-fifths vote. Um, 
Mr. Manning. Article 4, unpaid bills from previous fiscal years. We move the motion as printed in the Warren Articles and Motions document. Essentially, there were a couple of bills that came in um, that were a couple of years old or could have been a couple of years old, and uh, we would like to pay them now. Um, I can go through each one, or, or it's not yep, a large sounds amount. Sounds like we're, th these are essentially just delayed bills that got tucked someplace and didn't get to us in time. Any questions? This requires a four-fifths vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. And opposed. And it's unanimous and so carries. Article 5. Clarification: The motion and the uh, the motion that you made and the one that was on the screen differ. So you were saying that the money came from free cash. We need a clarification of that. I did not say it was for free cash. You want that as printed? I said as as printed. As printed says free cash. Okay, this is a sort of a legal formality that we've got to get right so that our treasurer doesn't beat up on us. So let's make sure that we all agree on what it is that we voted. You voted, your committee voted for coming from free cash, from, from budget transfers, okay? in accordance with that. So uh, why don't we make this clear for everybody? We'll just, um, uh, let's, let's make certain that we all understood what we voted on and we'll do it again. Uh, so the vote is to do it as budget transfers as projected on the screen. Is everybody clear on that now? And we can have a vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. And opposed, and it's unanimous, and so carries. This will save the treasurer a big headache. <laughs> Article six, because oh, yeah, uh, Article five was part of the consent calendar. Article six, uh, appropriations committee recommendation, Mr. Manning. Article 6, personal property tax bill threshold. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Essentially, this is uh, a personal property tax. So essentially, businesses in town with property, uh, personal property or property valued at less than $1,000, uh, there will not be bills for your personal property. Essentially, this will cost about $600 to uh, in, in tax of revenue we're not going to receive, but avoid sending bills that are just for a few dollars or even a few cents. Is everybody clear? Seeing no questions, we're ready for a vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. And opposed. And it's unanimous and so carries. Article 7, set the salary of elected officials. Um, and that would be Mr. Manning again. Uh, the personnel committee recommends this one, uh, but the required recommendation is from the appropriations committee. Okay, the appropriation committee recommends approval. 
Um, we had one dissension. Essentially, they thought, uh, given the level of experience. Oh, oh excuse me. Um, personnel committee, make uh, that's right. You're not making the motion. Personnel committee, make the motion. Move, move it as written. Move it as written. Okay. <laughs> Any um, further discussion on that, Mike? Yeah, essentially we voted three to one in favor of the motion. Um, the one dissension that they, uh, the person thought the salary was kind of high uh, and it should be more based on experience for the person going in. Personnel committee comments? Yes. Um, well, we spent quite a bit of time trying to determine what we would recommend as a salary. And uh, what we started with is um, we took the salary that we provided to the previous town clerk three years ago as a baseline salary. And then what we did is we added 1.75%, which is the average increase per year for a town employee that gets satisfactory um, uh, review, job review. Um, so the resultant was $65,630. Finally, the committee compared this number with that of other elected town officials in neighboring communities, and uh, we found that it to be in line and competitive. Okay, thank you. Comments? Mr. Garabedian. Tom Garabedian, final vote. Joseph Rowe. Uh, could the personnel committee clarify whether the survey was of elected officials as opposed to officials that are appointed by town managers? Yes. Absolutely. What, which was it? Elected officials. Absolutely. <coughs> Mr. Garabina, again? Okay. Okay. Seeing no further comments, I see that we are ready for a vote. All in favor of Article 7 for the uh, salary of the elected official signified by saying aye. aye and opposed and it's unanimous and so carries article 51 did I get that right yeah. personnel committee again Yes. Move the article as written. Yes, that's our proposal, <laughs> to move the article as written. Very eloquent, very eloquent. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the required uh, recommendation, the Board of Selectmen. Mr. Polico, do you have comments? Or somebody on the committee? Mr. Moderator, the board. Oops. Mr. Moderator, the board of selectmen voted in support of this article. And uh, I will point out that it requires a two-thirds vote. Uh, Mr. Kanicki, <laughs> we all have some discussion, I think. Teresa Rowe, uh, I'm basically in favor of this, and offer my support for the for the article. Mr. Garabedian. Tom Garabedian, five David Joseph Rowe. And I'm also in support of uh, a particular reason that when you have a, a professional for whom you're, you're providing a, a salary like this and it's elected, the town uh, ends up hamstring, it's hamstringing itself in the sense that if the performance is not satisfactory, you're stuck for the three year term paying the town clerk or pay, paying any professional the amount of money that has been established as a salary. And so I think it's important that this position be an, an appointed position so that there is some control over the performance of the individual. And if the performance is unsatisfactory, steps can be taken. Thank you. Mrs. Haynes. Darlene Hayes, One Third Road. I'm actually opposed for her to be appointed. I'd like it to stay elected for us to have someone from Hockington that's actually in town hall, voted in by the people, and also that becomes the face of 
our community, in a greeter to our community. I think that's very important that the person is elected and part of our town. Thank you. Mr. Weismantel. Ken Weismantel, 145 Ash Street. I think conceptually, I'm in favor of an appointed town clerk. However, I have a real problem with the process. We have a charter review board, or committee, that's going through the whole thing. And it seems that we kind of rushed this one ahead before we've kind of done the overall evaluation. And that kind of asks, leads to the question of kind of why did we do that? Are we unhappy with the two candidates that we have for town clerk? And we decided we have to punish them at this time and change the procedure? I, I, I think that we are getting ahead of ourselves with this particular vote today. And I think we feel much more comfortable after the charter commission has had public hearings, et cetera, like we talked about in the report. The other question, when I read through this, I'm confused, and maybe somebody can clarify, who actually appoints the person? Are we leaving this up to the legislation to kind of fill in that detail? Or, you know, is this appointed by the town manager, by the board of selectmen? By the moderator? I don't know. So, but maybe I'm just not reading it right on that one. So, maybe somebody could ask answer that question. If that's a specific question, is there somebody from the personnel committee that can mm -hmm. clarify that? Go ahead. I'm happy to do that. Um, my name is Patricia Duart at 107 Saddle Hill Road and presently serving as chair of the personnel committee. So, thank you for that question and opportunity to, to respond. And it's certainly one we've been. Um, asked a lot about in terms of why now and, and why this particular process. We found ourselves in a unique situation um, in that in the past we've had two experienced town, town clerks. Um, this action was not relative to any particular candidate. It's more of an uh, intent to strengthen the infrastructure for town governance in our belief that as an appointed position, and we use the word appointed, but we really mean hiring someone in a, in a, in a regular hiring process where you can vet individuals for qualifications and experience. Um, uh, could, uh, let, let's see if we can get to the specific question that Ken asked, which is, who is the appointing authority? It is our understanding that if the position is appointed, that the person would report to the town manager and as such would be making that hiring decision. Perhaps so, so you're saying the town know. manager is the appointing authority? That is our understanding. Okay, is, is that made explicit in the article before us? I don't believe that it is. This is more of an article to get your support for voting for this special act to have this structure changed. Okay. All right. We've got more questions. Muriel? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Muriel Kramer, 39 North Street. Uh, this is a red letter day. You're going to hear me say the words. I agree with Ken Wiseman. <laughs> uh, seriously, uh, this, not only do we have a process, but we have an open process uh, currently ongoing. We just heard a report for considering changes to the Charter. Changing the charter is something that um, we shouldn't undertake without considerable thought. I like the process. It's, it's a little bit deliberate, but that's the point. There are a lot of public hearings. Again, that's the point. Um, when we first instituted the charter, we noticed a lot of things right away that we might have done better, and we resisted making changes specifically, so we gave the charter a chance. We gave all of ourselves a chance to, to, to see how it worked and then undertake the process in 10 years, and that's what we're doing now. So my recommendation would be this question in front of the Charter Review Committee. Okay. What, is, is it in the... Yeah, if you want me to Yeah, I just, I would ask uh, for further clarification to Ken's question, I would ask Ray Miaris to uh, help us out with that. Good evening. Is this on? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, you'll see in the special act 
section three of the special act um, amends subsection three dash two D of the charter. That's the provision that uh, provides the authority to the board of selectmen to make various appointments. So um, the town clerk would be appointed by the board of selectmen, not by the town manager. Okay. Mrs. Altamira. Sandy Altamira, Elm Street. I'm um, speaking against this change. I agree with Muriel and Ken. I think that we do have something in place and it should be certainly looked at a lot closer rather than trying to do it tonight. Um, there's obviously questions, but I feel very strongly that we are solely taking more and more things out of our democratic overview. Uh, a town clerk that has to vet, or, vet themselves in front of the town uh, is responsible to the town and um, somebody who's been appointed tends to be responsible for the person that appointed them. I'm sure we'd get excellent candidates, but I'm very uncomfortable with taking one more position that the people of town can't vote on. Mr. Durso. Frank Durso, 173 Saddle Hill Road. I, I, I do agree with Ken and Muriel. Uh, I want to point out that the Board of Selectmen vote wasn't unanimous uh, and that right now we have two very excellent candidates uh, who I call friends and good luck to them. Uh, but I do think we have a process in place and we have professionals that work for our town. Brenda McCann uh, is our professional, uh, Elaine, Don McAdams, uh, that they're there to support the town and they do a very good job. So if we have elected officials to work with them like the planning board works with Elaine, like the Conservation Commission works with Don, um, like a town clerk works with Brenda McCann. That is, that's the way it works. It's not broken. I don't think uh, we should change that. Thank you. Mr. Yumina. Mr. Moderator, I also do not agree with this article for two reasons. One is that Hopkinton already has in place since the 1970s a recall bylaw. So if we have an elected official that's not doing the job or that we really dislike, uh, a petition goes around and that uh, can happen at an election. Um, the recall bylaw will, is capable of removing any elected official in the town. I don't know if anybody still remembers that, but I do because I was here back then when it passed. Number two, in the uh, warrant here and in this article and in a lot of the other, other articles, I get really upset when I see things like subsection 3A of section 12 of chapter 43B without any contextual uh, inclusion in the article, showing in the paragraph at least what exactly is being changed. And there are a lot of these things that are on this warrant tonight, which I really don't like, especially in the zoning bylaws and in uh, other sections S where there's a speak lot Speak to of this article. Okay, then I'll speak to this article. Yep. In this article, there are things that, are, that we don't have any contextual grasp of because the paragraph that this stuff is gonna be changed in is not included in the article. And I really don't like that when I feel 
that the right to vote on things in this town is being taken away from us sneakily, and we don't know what it is, and it really upsets me. So along with Ken Wisemantle and the other people who have spoken, I am dead set against this article because we don't need it. Go ahead. Just a point of clarification from the committee's perspective. When we explored the options uh, that might be available to us in terms of moving forward with this initiative to go appointed, we um, were made aware of the charter review process and timeline and one of our committee members spoke with the town legal in terms of the other option. Um, I can assure everyone that our only intent was to move things, uh, you know, sooner than later. Okay. Go ahead. Yes, I'm Chris Deeds, 44 Alexander, Alexander Road. Um, I, I rise um, against this article um, for all the reasons um, people have specified, especially separating it from the charter. And also I'd like to say that, um, that um, elected officials um, are responsible to the people who elected them. Um, appointed people are responsible to the, to the people who appointed them. And I don't think um, that should be the way this position should go. And also, I think people are making um, kind of a, a big deal about it being complicated and everything. And if you, um, if you look at the qualifications for town clerk, they include a high school diploma sub supplemented with courses in accounting, business education, office procedures, and computers. Um, and I think we have two qualified candidates who meet those qualifications. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Sestari. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Todd Sestari, 19 Elizabeth Road. Um, I am on the Charter Review Committee. I speak for myself. And first of all, I want to clarify comments that I made during a selectman's meeting the other night uh, in that um, I was expressing my opinion that uh, I am in favor of this, of this article. Um, the Charter Review Committee, as it's been mentioned a couple of times tonight, has taken no position on the article. Uh, I've spoken with town clerks in the past who, uh, they've gone through extensive training, uh, both before and during, uh, during their holding of the office. And this is a very technical position. And I guess one of the reasons that I support moving forward with this prior to going through the entire Charter Review process is to minimize, uh, minimize the change and the flux uh, that, that occurs within the town. Uh, I feel firmly that whether it happens now or uh, as a result of the charter review process, this is a smart move for the town. Um, but if it happens now, then maybe we can shortcut and we can find that one person who I know uh, there's concern about this being the face of the town, the person who is the face of the town, rather than changing that person in and out. Uh, we've been blessed with some very talented individuals uh, over the past uh, few decades, and I think that we should do everything we can as our town gets more complex and the position needs to comply with more laws and regulations that are governed by, the, uh, that are mandated by the state that we try to put our best foot forward and that we ensure that the candidate who comes forward and fills the position does have those qualifications and the proper training for the position. Thank you. Mr. Harrell. Ed Harrell, 8 Spring Lane. Um, I agree with many of the people who have spoke against this, uh, specifically Sandy who stole my speech nearly word for word. So my question now is we've had a 300 year history of having an elected town clerk. And I wondered if there's any history in those 300 years of having a town clerk that didn't do a good job. Go ahead. We'll good leave that as a rhetorical question. <laughs> good evening, Owen Mangan, East Street. I am uh, vice chair of the personnel committee. And I wanted to take a moment to explain, or give you some of our reasons why four individuals from four different backgrounds on the personnel committee, as well as our former town clerks, as well as the selectmen of the town, all endorsed, minus one, all endorsed this appointment. First of all, appointment's a terrible term. 
it indicates or suggests that Mr. Kamalo is appointing somebody for this. This allows the town to go out, recruit, hire, vet the very best town clerk available. We also get a chance to do background checks to check uh, education history and so forth. The person will be hired, vetted and hired, like the police chief, like the fire chief. Not appointed, not, not appointed based on a popularity contest or anything else. That's the reason we thought it was in the best interest of the town of Hopkinton and no other reason to move forward with this. That's all I have. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Moderator. Behind you. Just a point of clarification, Mr. Moderator. Yes. The vote of the board of selectmen was four to one in favor. It wasn't unanimous. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Dick Dugan, 38 Priscilla Road. I'd like to move the question, Mr. Moderator. All right. There's a motion to end debate. Um, that's not debatable. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Point of order. Yes. Mr. Mr. Moderator, I have a, is it legal for us to even do this? We've got an election to do process to. Uh, to try to stop an election process by making one doesn't stop um, the election process. Well, I understand that, but it also but is the number of people in this room voting for this amendment interfering with the rights of the candidate who has uh, you it know, doesn't good have faith, any effect on that. Has no effect. Okay. No, this doesn't. It, this, this is for the the next year. Okay. So before us is a vote to a motion to end debate. All in favor of ending debate signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed. No. And that's a clear two thirds and so carries. We can now vote on the motion before you, which is um, for um, a special act to appoint the town clerk. All in favor of appointment signified by saying aye. aye. And opposed? No. <laughs> and, and that fails. Uh, that's a, uh, and we can move on to Article 8. How do you announce the failure of property? Is that right? Yeah. Uh, that work? Article 8, operating budget. Um, Mr. Manning. So I do believe the motion is different on the screen versus the handbook. So I. Uh, Can you highlight the differences? Are there many? A, few, a couple of the years are correct in the written document. So there are some uh, edits for the written document. Yep. In the enterprise funds, specifically, they specified 2016, and there really should be 2017. Okay. So uh, anyway, I uh, move the motion as displayed on the uh, overhead screen. Ryan. And do you have a, a clarification on the three areas that are changed? Yep. Oh, hold on. Wait a second. Yeah. Um, except that all enterprise fund revenues are deemed to be from fiscal year 2017 rather than 2016, as stated on the screen, as summarized in and supported by the financial model from attachment four from 427 16 minutes on page three of 16 through 16 of 16 bringing the total operating budget to $75,982,132.38. Okay. Uh, is everybody clear? This is basically a, a, a typo, and we're, we're correcting it so that it's the correct year to take the enterprise funds. Scroll down to the enterprise funds. That's what we're talking about. Yeah.
So if you look at like the sewer enterprise fund, it says is correct saying fiscal year 2017 sewer enterprise revenue. And that is in, correct. And in the document, it says 2016. Correct. Okay. So how many Thanks. how many of these are there? Four of them, all told. I believe three. Three. Um, but it's also that it's coming uh, transfer from sewer fund uh, and through retained earnings transfer from the sewer fund. <coughs> These are the accounting nightmares that uh, plague the committee all year long. Uh, so is everybody clear on what we're voting? Hearing no objections, yes. Seamus, 36 Lakeshore Drive. Mr. Moderator, I move to divide the question as to separately consider Article 8, line item 422, relative to new control of Lake Massimo. Okay, there's a motion to divide the question, which is simply, I, actually, I can do that. Does, does that need a motion to do it? Needs a motion? Yeah. <coughs> do we have a second? And the motion is to basically extract <coughs> uh, <coughs> line item 422, which relates to weed control, uh, to be considered separately. So it lets us vote on the rest of the article and then discuss that part separately. That motion is in order. Uh, <coughs> any uh, discussion about dividing the question? All in favor of, uh, I think everybody gets what you, you want to divide it for. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Chokes me up. All in favor of dividing the question, signify by saying aye. aye. And opposed? No. I guess we have to have a standing vote on that. We have our counters ready. <coughs> All in favor of dividing the question, please stand. Dividing the question simply means removing this from the discussion of the overall budget to be considered separately. If you're in favor of splitting the two off, stand. And hold your orange voting card. I have zero on the stage. So Muriel, are you counting the... Uh, so I'll count the stage. Okay. How are we doing? Brenda, are your counters in here now? Do any of your counters want a vote? Do we have a way of getting them? I gave them the counter. No, 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 I'm saying any of your, your election volunteers. They should be all in here now, because I'm seeing up at the Okay. Stage. Mr. Moderator, center front, 14th. Stay standing until uh, the two, two sets of counters have the same vote. Did you get center front? <laughs> I got center front, 14. Twenty-four in the rear. On my left. Counting. On my right. Right, 32. Left, 30. 
left 30. All right, you folks can have a seat, and all who are opposed, please stand. I have seven on the stage. Center front eight. Center front eight. Center rear eight. Center rear eight. Right fourteen. Fourteen. On my right and on my left. Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight. Did you get the seven on the stage? Seven, eight, eight, fourteen, twenty-eight. Seven, eight, eight, fourteen, twenty-eight. Right. Uh, let me see what I got. Yeah, that's I got sixty-five, and it passes a hundred to sixty-five. So uh, we can go ahead, and the first part of that is to vote on the rest of the budget. Um, so before you, you have the town's operating budget. Minus the line item article 420, uh, line item 422. And uh, I guess we'd have to adjust the line item for, uh, we've got to adjust the, uh, the numbers there. Is a, what? Send it back. You guys are all set with new numbers for the operating budget minus line 422. We have to we have to go through the process of making a new motion, correct? Uh, so, uh, dividing the question, yeah, it would be yes. Go ahead and make a, a motion minus line four twenty two. It's just a new number. Is it just line item four twenty two, or do now we have to change the whole the whole motion on the total amounts? The, you need to change the. Um, Yeah, there, we've, we've got that calculation happening so that you will have a motion that has it minus line 422. All right. Line four, 422. So we need to, we need to do that minus line 422, line item 422. How many, how many things are involved in that? Mr. Moderator, point of clarification. Um, yes. The late mass not weeds is only one piece of line item 422. There are, there are a number of other, if you look at the report here, it says 422 and it has a bunch of stuff. Um, personnel, personal services, expenses, road maintenance, sidewalk maintenance, pavement management, stormwater system, and then late I mass misunderstood. So, so I think it has to be, you have to clarify it. It's either all of 422 or just the weed control portion. How, how did we? To split the line item. Move part of line 422 to consider late right. We're going to try to make this as precise as possible. The motion refers to the late weed control part. So that's just part. Okay. Point of clarification, if I understood the motion to divide, it was just the weed control portion of line 422. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. All those who voted. Um, can you? Absolutely. So we're, we're trying to get this clear. Um, was that everybody's... Uh, what we, we need is to have that everybody's understanding of, of what we voted on. And if that's not a clear understanding that all we're pulling out is the weed control portion of line 422. 
Uh, was there anybody that was unclear on that on their vote? And we can take the vote over again. It seems that there's... Yes, unclear. Do you want to take the vote over again? That's perfectly fine with me. Um, so to, for clarification, the point that we are voting on is whether to divide the question by removing line 422 weed control portion only. Okay? Just above where he had it. What did he do that was right? Can we get this up on the screen? Yeah, Can go you ahead. make a suggestion? Why don't we have the presentation that goes along with this article that talks about the entire town budget, then vote on the weed separated portion first, and maybe... This will become clear. Maybe it will all be... Sure, we can do it that way. That's a, that's a reasonable approach to it. Um, while we're trying to clarify this, uh, we're going to come back to a vote on dividing the question. In the meantime, we'll have a presentation on the overall town budget. Then we will vote on a, a well-worded motion that will be before you on the screen. And then we will vote on the, uh, that portion that has to do with weed control, up or down, however it turns out. And then we'll vote on the main article. Is it clear? All right. Um, Mr. Manning, or uh, Mr. Polico. Bruce, point of order. Go ahead, Mr. I thought you, I thought you were going to entertain a motion to, to another motion to divide. With greater clarity. I, and we'll do that after the presentation so, so we can get it. We'll have the presentation for the overall town budget, then get the motion to divide when it's clear and, and presented to our IT people so it can be uh, presented on the screen. Going to start off with a couple of show tunes here. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Ben Palaco, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. I'm here to talk about the budget tonight. Um, by way of starting and uh, illuminating Article 422 for further discussion, um, let me just say this: there is $60,000 in the budget this year for Lake Maspinock weed control. Uh, the board heard the community loud and clear last year about not using that money for weeds. Um, doing yeah. the best I can. Uh, okay. It's yeah. Not, All right. It's not Let me get up close. Over. How's that? Good? Yeah. All right. Here raise the microphone so I don't have to hunch over. Okay. I'm here to talk about the budget, but first I'm here to talk about weed control. Uh, article 422 in the budget, $60,000, which is the article, the, the topic under discussion here. Uh, the Board of Selectmen heard the community loud and clear last year. We know there's a lot of concerns about putting weed killers, sort of chemicals, into Lake Maspinock. The $60,000 that's in the budget, just to start this conversation, at least let you think about this while we go through the rest of this, is only to allow the town to spend money pending the final determination of the committee that was established last year that includes a DPW director, includes a number of other folks in town, residents of Lake Maspinock area. Um, their conclusions will come to, to the town for implementation and we will spend that money based upon their conclusions. So I want to be extremely clear and say this is not necessarily going for chemicals. Uh, it, it is utterly up to what comes out of this, what comes out of this group. There's no intention at this point <coughs> to use chemicals of any sort in Lake Maspinock. So we'll address that again later. Now I'm here to talk about the budget overall. Uh, we'll uh, have three presentations tonight. I'm here to do a brief introduction and summary. School department will come up and talk about their budget, and then we'll have the Appropriations Committee come up and do a, um, a larger review. <coughs> 
The Board of Selectmen this year put out a budget message that was quite clear to all departments. We asked them to come in with level funded budgets other than contractual obligations. We asked them to identify key strategic initiatives in the case we had some extra money or something that we thought would be particularly high impact we could put to work. And we also, as we always have, asked them to identify <coughs> on a continuing basis opportunities for cost savings and revenue enhancements. The point here was that we want to have a budget that is tight but that maintains the critical elements to protect the long-term fiscal health of the town. Why did we do this? Why are we doing this tight budgeting planning? A couple things. First of all, we've bought a lot of things in the past few years. We have a number of new capital expenditures that, have, that are going to be coming online. We'll start to pay those uh, debt payments back beginning fiscal year 2018. That includes, obviously that's the debt, but also there'll be increased operating costs with some of those as part of this. As you'll see in a second, we've also continued to have unfunded state mandates that impose significant expenses upon the town and take away some of our leeway. And then finally, uh, as we'll also talk about, a lot of our funding comes from new growth every year, which is sort of new structures that go up in town and start to pay taxes before they demand services. It is always unclear to us that that's going to continue at the kind of levels uh, it is currently at, and particularly at, at the fairly elevated levels it's at currently. Total budget this year is $80,463,916. Um, that uh, is a 2% increase over fiscal year 2016. N net impact of uh, net of new growth is about 2.46%. That's composed of a roughly $76 million operating budget, which is all those line items you saw up in the screen added together, less 422 if we take it out, and about $4.5 million of additional items, many of which we're going to vote later on. What are the key budget drivers? Schools are up about $1.76 million this year. Employee, employee health insurance is up about almost $500,000 this year. That, can, that could, continues to be a high growth expense for us. We have a payment management plan of $351,000 increase. We've got the state, state mandate for the stormwater management plan, which is $220,000 this year. And then we're making additional retirement contributions to Middlesex um, to, try to, to try to work down our unfunded liability there, and that's about $108,000 this year. Those are the largest items you'll, in the, of increases. So what's the good news about the budget? It really tightly controls expenses. Uh, it controls, in fact, everything we can extremely tightly without cutting services. It continues for at least a six-year running to tax the town below the level limit. Um, we have, uh, I don't believe, ever had a budget that has been a net increase greater than 2.5% for at least six years, and I think it's actually may have been more than that. Um, and it continues to address a number of critical long-term items. Right, We're trying to provide high-quality services desired by the town particularly that goes to the schools. We need to maintain our capital equipment in all our buildings to make sure they don't fall into disrepair and incur larger expenses down the road. And we have some very sizable obligations to our employees, both retirement and OPEB, which stands for other post-employment benefits, that we are obligated to pay those folks down the road. Those are very large liabilities of the, for the town, and we have to continue to work those away. What's the bad news about the budget? As you'll see, our discretionary expenses as a percentage of the total expense increases continues to decline. Most of the spending you'll see this year is either contractual or mandated. We also, as I said earlier, are highly reliant on new growth revenue to reduce the tax impact. And there's a lot of questions we should all be cognizant of regarding that. Is it sustainable, especially at the high levels it is now? Is it desirable? Does it take the town the direction we want to go to? Right? It's sort of, it assumes a continued high pace of, of growth. Or is this money wagging the dog? And then also, there's been a long-term open question of do the long-term costs of this new growth exceed the revenues and make this essentially a losing proposition as a whole? That's a, those are very important questions we have to be cognizant of in the budget. And finally, I'm going to take this chance to make, give you a few final thoughts that are, um, that are more or less budget-related, but uh, a couple of larger items I'd just like to put out um, to people this year to think about. First of all, I've lived in town for 19 years, and in 1997 I moved here and the tax base was 80% residential and 20% business, and it was about two or two and a half billion dollars of total property value. Today, we've got about three and a quarter total billion dollars of total property value. It's 83% residential and 17% business. I've heard for many, many years this desire to shift the tax burden onto businesses, bring new businesses to town, sort of, right, sort of reduce the impact on the residents. The fact is, this town is always going to be an 80% plus residential tax base. That's not a prediction, that's just simple arithmetic. We have an enormous installed base of homes that grows very rapidly every year. 
to, to simply to keep pace with that on the business side, you'd have to have m multiple millions of dollars this year, perhaps tens of millions of dollars a year in new business revenue coming in. Nothing about that is ever going to happen in this town. For us to generate a million dollars in tax revenue, we, have, we don't have a split rate, so everybody pays the same rate, requires $58 million of taxable value creation. That's a very large structure. To move this number by 4%, just to get it back to where it was 19 years ago when I moved here, you need $125 million in new business building. That is comparable to all the structures that EMC has today on South Street. It's an enormous undertaking. Once you accept that fact, it has, in my opinion, very profound implications for how you think about development and how you want to approach development going forward. Business development is not a panacea for high tax rates in town. That leads to a further point. Some point down the road, and the board is likely to start to talk about this the last couple of years, and we brought it up particularly again this year, this town may need to take a harder look at what's necessary versus what's desirable. We are currently, believe it or not, a moderate tax, but a very high quality service and very high growth town. That's, what, that's our, our, essentially our, our model today. That's unstable in the long term, because not all those factors are going to be able to continue the way we want them to. And if any of them shift, it has profound implications for the town. That means over, over down the road, we have to think about whether we're going to raise taxes substantially, whether we're going to get everything declined slowly, or whether we're going to tighten the focus up on what services the town provides. That's a long-term conversation we need to start having. And then tying all this together, again, in my opinion, having done this for a long time now, we need to do a much better job of tying all of our, how all of our boards and committees act to an overall vision that we in town have. We've got a lot of groups that pursue, at times, divergent in, uh, agendas or are simply reacting to events. And I will just say that I do believe that, that we should find a way to have a more unified approach to this based upon a common understanding of where you want this town to go. With that, I'm going to turn this over to the school committee to come up and talk about their budget. So I'd like to begin by just thanking everybody. I think uh, what Mr. Polico just mentioned around the tremendous support uh, that you have for the school department is not lost on us. We appreciate the support, the ongoing support of the town um, that is consistent with your high expectations for the performance of our schools. So thank you for that. I'd like to thank the school committee for their leadership in the our budget process, which is lengthy and very, very involved. And then I'd like to thank the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Kamalo, the Appropriations Committee, and the Capital Improvement Committee for their thoughtful questions and attention to detail through this entire process. Uh, so with that, we can begin our presentation. I'm gonna take this off. So I'll begin with our budget highlights. Um, uh, consistent with our strategic plan and our priority initiatives. Uh, one of our priority initiatives is to increase staffing to support them. And I think when you think about the schools, the thing that we have to provide most of our attention to is providing the right instructors that can support the focus of our schools that is ongoing and ever-changing. So you'll see in this year's budget, um, bringing on reading coaches, they have a very specific role that I can speak more to. English language learners to address the um, increase, the, the great increase actually in the number of students, second language learners that are moving into our town, um, that we have very specific requirements on providing that kind of education. Elementary Adjustment Counselor, this is at the uh, Hopkins School where we are having increasing needs for social emotional support. Um, BCBA, that stands for a behavior, I asked our SPED director just this afternoon, board certified behavior analyst, thank you very much, um, and uh, increase to maintenance in our maintenance department. Also, uh, another highlight is providing school facilities that support effective instruction, and you can see the things listed there uh, that will be included under that item. I was given this to help me out. Um, targeted professional development. This is really important for us to think about and plan for. It's fine to say that we have priority initiatives and to bring on new programs and to bring on new materials for teachers, but if we don't give them the time 
and the professional development that they need to implement those new instructional programs, nothing's going to happen. So this is something we have to plan for. We have limited time in our school year, either through early release or full professional development days in which to provide this kind of professional development. And we work very hard to focus the PD plan with the, the new initiatives that we're bringing on. Uh, technology. We have a lot of competition out there now. The, the technology requirements that are being expected of all school districts has grown exponentially over the past, even since I've been here. And the plan that is included in our budget is there to attract and sustain a high-functioning technology support staff in a highly competitive market. Um, meeting the needs of high le needs learners continues to be a priority. You've heard me talking about this in past years. It continues to be something that we need to prioritize in order to uh, give kids what they need early on and avoid later special education increased costs. costs. Um, and along with that is using student assessment results to establish high expectations. We have a lot of information. We have a lot of data. We need to take that data and use it to make informed decisions about what kids need, and we need to do it on an ongoing basis. Not just with MCAS, not just at the end of the year, but throughout the year, we need to be looking at all of this great data that we have on kids and using it to adjust our practice in providing the best instructional program for kids. This is a, an overview of the, of the enrollment projection consistent with NESDEC projections. What you see overall is what we might describe as flat. I think this provides some reassurance that not that we're not having ongoing enrollment, but that we have capacity to meet the needs of the students moving into our district um, for, the, for, the, for the amount of projected time that we have. So we continue to watch this on an annual basis. Uh, but from what we can see ahead of us right now, we're, we're in very good shape. I wanted to point out this slide under original requests. I wanted you to understand how much time and attention and discussion and thorough analysis goes into our budget process with the school department. The initial request, the original request, uh, is, is the results of all of the schools and all of the departments, which at the beginning, which I would say was probably November, um, was at almost 7.5%. That is not to say that these things are not needed, but what we did to get from 7.46 to 4.49 is say, what can you not do without? What absolutely needs to be in place next year? What can wait for a following year? What can we do differently? We really challenged ourselves to look closely at all of these things. And I have to say, I'm really proud of the administrative team because we did this together. It wasn't a competitive, I need the, this amount of money and another school needs that. We looked together at our strategic plan and determined where the priorities needed to be for the FY17 budget year. And you can see that where we are un under the updated requests, um, I'd like to point out that these reductions um, you can see to not only existing staff, um, but also uh, requested new staff and um, expenses resulted in the 4.49% the increase. This is a comparison between FY16 and FY17. And I wanted you to just see that the, we, we remain consistent within the schools, not surprisingly, that the majority of our budget is a result of payroll, but the percent split um, is consistent with past years. These are the changes to payroll. I wanted to point out in this slide uh, that the personnel reductions, you can see new personnel um, listed here. What's import important to point out is that personnel reductions are a result of resignations retirements, but also some changes in direction and some difficult decisions that we needed to make relative to new strategic priorities and constantly asking ourselves if we want to bring on a new initiative, therefore, what can we start doing differently? And we bring that mindset to our discussions. We are not just constantly adding on more staff. So that's what this slide demonstrates. And here are, here's the slide demonstrating the expense changes. 
So we will be happy to entertain any questions as we go through this um, process, the, the, the rest of the meeting tonight. Um, and thank you for the opportunity. What happened here? Okay. Good evening. My name is Michael Manning, and I am Chairman of the Appropriations Committee. The Appropriations Committee is pleased to present the 2017 budget. Here are the budget highlights. The budget maintains current town services while investing in key areas to accomplish strategic goals. As the population in Hopkinton increases due to legacy farms and other planned residential projects, the budget reflects the plan to provide the necessary support and services. Last year's budget included additional police and fire personnel. This year's initiatives include additional funding for part-time positions, including a human resources administrative assistant, an IT help desk technician, senior center receptionist, a town clerk administrative assistant, and a youth and family services clinician. <coughs> New full-time positions include a facilities custodian and a public works heavy equipment operator. The school department has 500,000 initiatives in their 2016 budget. The Board of Selectmen wanted a budget that impacts the taxpayers no more than 2.5%. This year's budget meets the re that request with an overall tax impact of 2.46%. There were also some challenges, such as unfunded state mandates, which includes a requirement to improve monitoring of the town's catch basins and stormwater runoff. Also, there is a significant increase in the town's paving budget to keep our road repair plan on track. I'm sure many of you who drive around town will appreciate the repaving of our roads at an increased pace. This year, there has been significant fiscal restraint in preparing this year's budget with our excess levy capacity now over 1.5 million. This year's budget sets aside $612,000 for OPEB or other post-employment <coughs> benefits. The town now has a specific year-over-year -year amortization <coughs> schedule. We did not allocate the needed amount over the past two years. This year, a higher amount has been allocated to OPEB to keep the contributions on track. <coughs> Next year, we will be aligned, and the town's annual scheduled contributions will be lower by about $200,000. We are also allocating $300,000 to the town's rainy day fund, or stabilization account. The town's finance handbook recommends having a stabilization fund containing 5% of the town's annual operational budget, about $3.5 million. We currently have $2.4 million in the stabilization account. Our capitalization stabilization fund has 305,000, and the OPEB trust has 827,000. Real estate and property taxes are the primary source of revenue for town services. The allowable levy is calculated by taking the base levy, which is $54,420,823, then adding the proposition two and a half increase, debt exclusions, and new growth. The projected new growth remains similar to last year's $1.5 million. Development at Legacy Farms continues to be strong. The total allowable levy is $59,984,957. With the budget being presented, the actual levy will be $58,203,078, resulting in an excess levy capacity of approximately $1.781 million. Other sources of revenue include state aid, which is up by $200,000 in 2017. Local receipts are also up by $200,000. This is primarily due to increased revenue from auto excise tax. Enter enterprise funds are down because of sewer enterprise accounting correction. As you can see, other available funds has dropped due to lower reimbursements to the general fund. General government spending is up 8%. 
This increase is due to funding for a human services administrative assistant, IT help, IT help desk technician, and a town clerk administrative assistant. The school budget is up 4.49%, and the key tech budget is down 8.8% .8 due to decreased enrollment. Public works is up 17% due to the unfunded mandate for stormwater system monitoring. Health and human services is up 8.7% for additional staffing at the senior center and the addition of a part-time mental health clinician for youth and family services. Culture and recreation is up 8.6% for the additional funding of a children's resource <coughs> librarian. This position was created and partially funded last year. The fiscal year 17 budget now fully funds the position. The cost of health insurance has increased by 6.3%. As you can see from the pie chart, the school department has the largest proportion of the budget, accounting for 53% of the total budget. Employee, employee benefits and insurance is 12.6%, and debt service is 6.2%. Our capital articles. The Appropriations Committee recommendations for this year's articles are based on face-to-face -face meetings with department heads and article sponsors. Sound, sound and responsible financial planning, and commitment to the execution of the town's comprehensive asset management plan. This year, the comprehensive asset management plan does not require any significant building repairs or replacement. For fiscal year, six, 17 capital articles will either be funded through free cash or debt repayment within the levy limit. For the average single family home, Valued at $525,705, the projected tax levy for fiscal year 17 is $58,203,078. Less projected new growth, the tax impact will be 2.46%. The average household will see an increase of $220.36. So I just want to... I just want to, usually we'll show on a final slide um, the, the impact of debt. Um, we weren't able to get all the numbers in a graph for you, but I just wanted to talk about um, our future excluded debt. With the, approval, with the approval of major capital projects behind us, when the projects are complete, such as the DPW library and center school replacement, by fiscal year 19, the estimated impact will be 3.9 3.9 million in interest in principal payments, decreasing annually. The impact will be about $663 per average single family household. This is an estimate as interest rates and other factors can impact the final cost of the taxpayer. And there may other be some other methods of whether it's lev level um, borrowing or, or declining 20 years, 30 years. But I just wanted to give an idea of what to expect in 18 and 19. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a, an excellent uh, presentation. I hope we've got a good overview. Um, next order of business is we have a motion to divide the question. And uh, as per Mr. Wisemantle's suggestion, we'll uh, take a look and see if you want to divide the question first. And after the vote on that, we will consider the... Um, the subdivided portion first and then the overall budget. So can we have a projection on uh, that original motion so that we're clear for everybody and we're going to re-vote that? What, the motion to divide the question. Do you have that, Josh? Is that sufficient to divide just the 60? Yes. All right. So all we're talking about, what's the total? 60,000. This is just dealing with the $60,000 of the Lake Maspinock weed as separate from the rest of the operating budget. All right. We're ready to, to vote. All in favor of dividing the question, 
signified by saying I. I. And opposed. No. <laughs> okay, stretch your legs. All in favor, please stand and we'll, we'll do the count now that we understand what we're voting on. I have zero on the stage. Twenty-one on the left. Twenty-one on my left. Center rear, fifteen. Fifteen in the rear. Eleven center front. <laughs> On my right. Twenty-eight on the right. Twenty-eight on the right. All right, now you folks can have a seat. No, I guess you already have. All opposed, please stand. I have seven on the stage. In the front. Center front, 12. 12 in the front. 36 on the left. 36 on the left. 26 on the right. 26 on my right. Seventy-six and it fails seventy-six to ninety-four with that clarification. Now we're ready to consider the main motion, which was the original motion before you, which was for the entire town budget. Uh, questions? Mr. Humana. Mr. Moderator, Mike Humana, 24 Chestnut. Um, does this town budget include monies for making the school buses that come uh, to, this, to this building and all the other schools here in town go back to being free again like they always were and I feel personally are supposed to be. So let's so that let's can, have a, do you want an answer to that specifically? I want an answer to that question. Sure. Because I'm tired of living in a town where twice a day the downtown area and our whole town is snarled up like a snake wrapped around a tiger and it's impossible to get through. Traffic is, uh, you know, just totally flooded in the town. And if there's an emergency vehicle needs to get through, or if there's anything that should happen at our schools, this is a, a very bad way to make it easy for those things to happen. And I would, my personal feeling is I would send this budget back 
and tell them to trim some more somewhere and find us a way to make our school buses uh, take our children to school like they should be so that our traffic can be normal and we don't have to worry about every time something happens on 495 and the traffic all gets diverted up through here and it's a, just a quagmire whenever that happens. Even when it doesn't happen, it's bad. And I really would like to hear some dialogue about if there's a way that we can possibly do that. Thank you. I, I would point out that uh, the school budget we vote as a single uh, number and that that discussion is probably more proper for the um, school committee meeting, but I'll let the, the school, uh, and Ms. McNichols. Lori Anderson, the vice chair of the school committee. Um, to answer your question, sir, the uh, school committee did have this discussion during our budget meetings all through November and December, um, which concluded in January, and the busing for the upcoming fiscal year 17 will be free of charge for grades K through six, no matter where you live in town. And there still will be fees, um, which were kept level set this year for grades seven through 12. Mr. Durso. Frank Durso, 173 Saddle Hill Road. Um, we were told that there is a discretionary funds for the town manager to spend, which we spent on uh, $16,000 a year for library parking this past year and some reports that we've got for the planning board. Uh, I don't see that in this budget. I'd like to ask where that is and how that's identified so we can see how much we spent last year and how much we're gonna spend this year and, uh, and generally what it's spent on. Uh, 60,000 in uh, discretionary funds, is that, uh, do you, does somebody have an answer to this? We're working on it. Thanks, I'll wait. <laughs> Mr. Polico? <clears throat> is it on? Okay. So the parking lease is paid for out of the facilities budget. And the report we did, I, th I assume, Frank, you mean the LNG facility report? Sure. Yeah, that's going to come out of end of year budget transfers. Okay, so that means free cash? Uh, if that money wasn't used, it would otherwise go into free cash, yes. Okay, does that answer your question? Thank you. Mr. Parker, or I can't see who it is. Go ahead, next person. Bob Levinson, 13 Smith Road. I uh, might have missed my opportunity with the discussion about the school budget, but I'll take this opportunity now. Just like some clarification that uh, the superintendent's words, the uh, projected increase in non enrollment is flat, yet the request is for about a 4.5% increase in the budget. I just kind of couldn't get that visibility. And second part of the question is, is revenue from international students factored in at all? Uh, Mrs. Nicholson. Dr. McLeod, Mrs. Nicholson. So yes to the F-1 visa uh, monies. And uh, point of What are F-1 visas for those of us not as initiated? Those are the... The international... International program. students. Okay, got it. Um, it's a great question because it's about how we're doing our work differently. It's about service, servicing kids in a way that co is costing more than it was. So although it seems at face value that same number of kids, more money, the reality is that the needs of the kids that we are servicing are greater, and the programs that we have in place cost more um, because of the needs of the kids. So that's why you see the increase as it's, as it's uh, requested. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, yeah, behind not, you? Not really, but... Um, I, you know, You're satisfied with the answer as much as you can be. Thank you, am I? Okay. Uh, not really. <laughs> okay, <laughs> go for it. Is there, so, is there a follow-on question? Know, well, I'll is wait there a follow-on question? question? Uh, it's just, it, 
I just don't have line of sight into what intake to say, look, I asked for seven and a half, and I'm only, now I'm only asking for four and a half. Mm -hmm. It's like saying, I'm not going to eat both pieces of cake, just one. I, I just don't see where there's been any cuts or anything. I just, again, don't have a line of sight into that. Understandable. Intake. Yeah. I guess I, I share that information a, as a point of illustrating how detailed the work is and how long the process is and the level of scrutiny that the school committee brings to the discussion. So to, to be able to explain the differences um, just in a snapshot is very difficult. Uh, I, but the, the slide was meant to really show um, how much goes into our process to get to our request. Thank you. Behind you. Uh, Henry Siegel, 112 Hayden Row. Uh, we have, I assume we'll be voting on later in the meetings, 3.652 million of additional borrowing for uh, different articles. That obviously is not reflected in the budget that we are approving at this section tonight. What would be the tax impact if all those budgets were, or articles were approved on the upcoming uh, uh, levying the taxes? Mr. Manning, if everything's approved, what's the, the tax impact? Well, there's no impact uh, this year on the borrowing, um, but it will be in follow-up years. Because it will be in follow-up years. Within the levy capacity. Within the levy capacity, which is now whatever it is, 1.5 million, what you said. Right, but once the projects are done, we do the borrowing, so it'll be in fiscal year 18 and 19, and so forth. Okay, does that answer your question? What would it be impact us approximately in fiscal 18? I, I think that's out of the four corners of this article. So we'll get to that. At, at, that was part of their original presentation, but uh, that's getting beyond our scope. Go ahead. Ron Shamus, 36 Lake Shore Drive. At the Weed Committee meeting um, last Thursday night, uh, I pointed out that some of the uh, chemicals that are being considered by the committee um, are banned in several countries around the world, even though they're approved by the EPA. They cause liver damage damage and it's upstream from all our kids go swimming and many of our homes. So my question to the selectmen, because now that the budget is going to remain in public works, then we're going to make the lead committee's going to make a recommendation to public works and make a recommendation to the selectmen. Will the will the town have the opportunity to discuss and vote the chemicals that are going to be used to foliate the budget? Mr. Polico, do we need John up there? So the process is as follows. We set up the Weed Management Committee, you know, with including, like I said before, DPW director, residents from around the lake, et cetera, et cetera. They have been asked to go off and determine the best method of solution. And it could be a number of things, right? The drawdown this year was part of it. Right? There's been discussion of harvesting. There's a whole lot of things. It's, it's a fairly deep dive they're going to do. They're going to come back to the Board of Selectmen at some point with a recommendation about what actions they want to take. I assume it will have been done in consultation, right, in a public forum, first of all, so everyone can have input. And second of all, there will have been a lot of discussion that all of you will have been privy to. They'll come with a comprehensive solution. The Board of Selectmen will discuss it in a public meeting. The Board of Selectmen may determine to take more public input if they decide, ask questions, write, do further evaluation, and then the Board of Selectmen will decide how they want to go forward with this. So I'm not trying to prejudge anything, um, but I do want to make very clear there are multiple, multiple cuts at the apple here, right? There's one ongoing right now with the committee. There'll be another one I expect when it comes forth. And, but I want to be clear, at the end of the day, the, once the Board of Selectmen votes, that's what we'll do. Mr. Wiseman. Ken White at 145 Ash Street. My question has to do with the Water Enterprise Fund uh, line 450. Where are we on our water conservation efforts 
Have we achieved the 10% state uh, unaccounted for water goal? If not, do we have money for consultants to help us uh, get to that goal? And two, do we have money for meters and uh, manpower to replace meters so that we replace 10% of our water meters as recommended to uh, get to our goal? Mr. Westerling, our DPW director. Good evening, through you, Mr. Moderator. Um, we are continuing with our water conservation um, plan that we have. Uh, we do ongoing water leak detection. We do that both in-house and with the use of consultants. Um, this year there is an increase in the meter budget to facilitate additional meter replacement and also to keep pace with the development that we're seeing in legacy farms. Oh, and, and finally, uh, through you, Mr. Moderator, we did not meet the 10% uh, as recommended by DEP. Where are you on that? Uh, through you, Mr. Moderator, may I ask uh, Eric Cardi, our water sewer manager, what last year's unaccounted for water number was? And to follow up on that through you, Mr. Moderator, uh, the past, this, this past year we were at 18%, the year before that we were at 16%, which is a considerable reduction from where we were, which was in the low 20% for several years. And so we're trying to get down to the 10. Okay. Uh, I, I follow on. Yes. How, how many water meters, what percentage of water meters will get replaced next year? Three, Mr. Moderator, it's our goal to meet the DEP recommendation of 10 percent. B. B. McMillan, 8 Lakeshore Drive. Mr. Moderator, I have a question and to the school committee. I'd like to compliment them for the excellent presentation that they did to the slide. I think it's a great job, but I have a question. <laughs> My question is, I cannot see it in our report that we have, how much that the school administration building or department, how much do they pay monthly? I'm not sure if I put the question right, but I have... We'll let you, we'll let, let you have another bite at the apple. Let's see what they, uh, they can come up with for an answer. How much does it cost to run the administrative building. Mrs. Nicholson. Mr. Moderator, I just have to correct you. My last name is Nickerson. <laughs> but um, to answer your question, the annual lease um, spend on the administrative building is approximately 80000 per year. Can I put it? Could I put a PS on that one? Yeah, sure. Okay. My thoughts are when the central school is replaced, could perhaps the school, we save the money, put the, the school administration in the central school. And then I have some other crazy ideas. One is perhaps, uh, the, as I've heard about the kids, the teenagers wanting a school center. That center school, there's a lot of possibilities. But my thing of the school administration, that's a lot of money in there. I guess I'm looking at my pennies. Thank you. Okay. Behind you. Carol DeVer, 47 Chamberlain Street. And I just had a question regarding general um, government. In looking at the salaries and the payroll numbers on here, they, um, they seem to be going up quite a bit. And I was just wondering, can you tell me exactly how many bodies we've added to 
general government and what percentage increases we're looking for the positions we have. Do we have an answer for that? We're working on an answer. The uh, net increase in general government people last year was four. The reason you see the big jump in the spending is because we negotiated new contracts, particularly with police and fire, that required back pay. This is, I'm sorry, through you, Mr. Moderator, this is general, general salaries, not, not the police and fire. What line item are you at? Just help me, help point me in the right direction then. Well, just, um, I don't know, treasurer collector went up $90,000 from what I'm seeing from, from last year's appropriation to the, or from the 15 appropriation to the 17 town manager budget. Finance um, directors also going up quite a bit. Yes, uh, good evening, town meeting. The simple explanation is that as we were filling the new position, the positions that we identified, including the finance director, we paid more than what we were paying in prior years. In addition, you rightly pointed out that general government does not include public safety. What I think needs to be shared with the public is that the funding that we reserve for contractual obligations is in general government and is then transferred to the public safety government uh, budgets uh, at a later date. Does that answer your question? That confuses me more than I started off. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll accept that. I have one, one last question. Sure. Um, I read recently that we have an assistant um, town manager. Is that, in fact, true? Mr. Polico? Uh, it's not true. Well, it's effectively. Right. Uh, uh, we're discussing how much we want to split hairs on this one. We have a director of land use planning and permitting who's also taking on some additional roles in the town manager's office, filling part of the job that was vacated by the former operations assistant to the town manager. So in effect, is she, are we moving this person to the assistant town manager role? Yes. Um, does the person technically have that title at this point? No. At the other mic. I move to call the question. Okay, well, it doesn't seem like there's anybody behind you. Do I have a second on that, or can we just go ahead and vote? No, hearing no second. I see that we're ready for a vote. Good try, though. I like that. Um, I, before you, you have Article 8, which is as was originally projected. There are no uh, amendments. It's the town operating budget. All in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. And opposed. And it's a uh, clear majority and so carries. Article 9, revolving funds. Article 9, revolving, 2017, revolving funds. We move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. And the Board of Selectmen, how did you vote? Approval? Mr. Moderator, the Board of Selectmen voted in favor of this article. Okay. Appropriations Committee, can you explain what we're voting on? Essentially, these are our revolving funds. Um, pretty much is the same year over year, but this year we do have two new revolving funds. Uh, one is for the Senior Center Programs Fund, and another one is for Police Department Detail Administrative Fees. Any questions? 
Seeing none, we're ready for a vote. Before you, you have the revolving funds article. All in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. And opposed. And it's unanimous and so carries. Article 10, highway funds. Mr. Manning. Article 10, Chapter 90, Highway Funds. Uh, we move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. And how, uh, the capital improvements, Mr. Oram. Capital improvement recommends approval. And can you explain what we're doing? Uh, simply, this authorizes the town to spend Chapter 90 highway funds for road repair and other uh, road uses, road fixes. Any questions? Seeing none, we're ready for a vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. And opposed. And it's unanimous and so carries. Article 11, transfer to stabilization. Article 11. Article 11, transfer to general stabilization fund. We move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. Board of Selectmen. Board of Selectmen voted, Board of Selectmen voted in favor of this article. Uh, Mr. Manning. Essentially, uh, we are transferring uh, $300,000 uh, from free cash to our general stabilization fund. Question. Mr. Garabedian. Tom Garabedian, 5 Day and Joseph Grove. Um, <clears throat> again, I question why this article is placed where it is when we don't know how much money town meeting is, is going to spend. It seems to me that it would be better to wait uh, on this until the end of town meeting when we know how much money might potentially be sent to the stabilization fund. <laughs> Mr. Manning? Do you have uh, so essentially uh, prior to town meeting the various departments work especially uh, the finance director with the town manager uh, how to prepare the budget uh, we know what our free cash is what has been authorized and uh, taking all the articles we recommend uh, we know what our free cash and we have this free cash to put into the stabilization fund further questions all right we're ready for a vote all in favor of, uh, this requires a two-thirds vote. All in favor of transferring $300,000 to stabilization, signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed? And it's uh, unanimous and so carries. Uh, OPEP, other post-employment benefits liability trust fund. Mr. Manning. Article 12, other post-employment benefits liability trust fund. We move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. Mr. Polico. The Board of Selectmen recommends approval of this article. Mr. Manning, can you explain what we're doing? So we're appropriating uh, $612,000, 640, $612,000, $647,000 uh, to the OPEB fund from free cash. Uh, this is part of our amortization schedule. We're, as I mentioned in my uh, overview earlier, that this is a higher amount than otherwise we would need to provide year over year uh, to, to get in sync with the amortization schedule. Steve Popkis, 24 Cedar Street Extension. Can you expound a little on the amortization I schedule? I thought you'd never ask. Mr. Polico, can you expound on this? Go ahead. Josh, you got a slide for me? Oh, there we go, good. Okay, we figured there would be some questions about OPEB, so it's a great chance to get up and talk about a fascinating topic, at least to me. Um, the uh, other post-employment uh, benefits liability trust fund was established by a town in 2012, and in reaction to the fact that we, we have this very large liability, um, this covers payments for employees post-retirement for things like medical, dental, that sort of health care. Uh, the current fund balance, after all these years of uh, putting money into it, is about $826,000, as you can see. The actuarial unfunded liability, as of our most recent valuation, is about $9.3 million. Uh, again, as a finance person, I'll point out that makes some fairly heroic assumptions, one of which is we fully pre-fund that balance, and the second is that you get 8% annual return on your investments, which I think any of us would uh, be jealous of. 
The annual contributions, to your point, are determined by an amortization schedule that was worked out several years ago, and the, the goal is to address the shortfall by 2045, um, to have it fully funded by that date. And so you back off from there, you work out an annual return, and you, uh, you essentially come up, the, the solution you get is an annual obligation you have to put in. Uh, so the proposed transfer this year of about $613,000 is a little bit less than $400,000, which is to cover the fiscal year amortization payment. And also, we didn't fully fund last year's amortization payment, so the other $215,000 is, uh, is to, to fulfill that. A um, couple points here that, you know, we always get these questions, so let's just get in front of them. Um, people say, well, why do you want to pay for this? The feds will bail us out, the state will bail us out. Actually, that's not the case. Um, they, as you are, I'm sure are well aware, they have even larger unfunded obligations and lawmakers have clearly and consistently and repeatedly made it clear that municipalities are going to be on their own for this. There is going to be no government bailout, no lifeline. Um, and the other point out to me I would like to make is that uh, uh, two things. First of all, if you don't fund this liability, it's going to increase substantially because, of course, the longer you wait, you're making no return that money, so the, uh, the actual liability becomes larger over time, so it'll be, a, it'll be larger payments down the road. And the second is that this is a current generation obligation. It's being incurred by current taxpayers for current employees of the town providing current services. And so, again, from a moral perspective, uh, there's a clear obligation not to just defer this onto future generations. That's my open discussion. Mr. Garabedian. Some follow-up questions on the assumptions. You make an 8% assumption on the return on the investments. What is the discount rate that's used to discount the liability itself? Yeah, so I, I make none of this. This actually is done by actuaries that we hire. And so there's a full GASB report. They issue it, I think, every two years. So we have the most current one. The discount rate, uh, I don't know that I know that off the top of my head, but I... Um, uh, right, we could look up the report. I could email you the report and you could read it to your own heart's content. As an actuary, I think you probably have a good idea of how, how this is done. Well, you know, my sense is, uh, with some knowledge of GASB, that we're probably greatly understating the amount of liability. Oh, yeah. You know, these assumptions are unrealistic both as to the discount rate and as to what healthcare inflation is going to do. Could, uh, could I ask one more question? Sure. Related to this? What is the town share of the obligation for its retired employees? Is it is it fifty percent? Uh, that's my recollection. You are correct, sir. It's fifty. Thank you. Kevin Shea, twenty-five Thayer Heights Road. I uh, have a couple of questions, Mr. Moderator. First, this is something we've passed on for two years, and it seems to me that we have the opportunity to pass on it again, uh, which I'm not advocating. Uh, so my question is, since this is such a clear and present deep obligation, is there a way we can make it this part of the annual budget? Because to your point, it is a current expense. And not for this year, going forward. Going forward. An That's answer? actually an interesting question. We, we've had some discussion about this in the past. There's a few of these that are actually liabilities that we pay out of free cash. The you, you would have a very good argument for why it should be in the operating budget. I think factually that we've been able to pay for this out of free cash every year. Um, so if, if the free cash balance has declined beyond a certain point, I think we'd, we'd want to do that. But at the end of the day, if you put in the operating budget and don't use it in free cash, you're just sort of moving po money from the left pocket to the right. So I, I agree with you on the theoretical perspective. It just hasn't been an issue to date. Uh, Mr. Moderator, what was the last two years not paid or contributed? Do you have an answer to that, Mr. Manning? Last two years not paid? We did part of it last year. Yeah, right. We did part of it special town meeting in 2015. We know that. I think the year before, I think we didn't do it. Yeah, we have, but that's why we're paying the rest. And I don't think we paid the year before that. I think there was a... Uh, uh, I th it was in the it was a warrant article, and to my recollection, an individual stood up in opposition, 
and uh, because there was no amortization schedule, we were showing the town and the town voted down that year. Okay. Further questions? I see we're ready for a vote. We have before us Article 12, other post-employment benefits liability. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed? That's unanimous and so carries. Article 13, pay-as-you-go expenses. Uh, Mr. Manning. Article 13, pay-as-you-go capital expenses. We move the motion as printed in the Warren Articles and Motions document. And how did the uh, selectmen vote? Uh, the Board of Selectmen voted in favor of this article. And uh, Mr. Oram? Capital proven we voted in favor. Okay, some discussion on this, Mr. Manning. So uh, we have various capital purchases using pay-as-you-go uh, uh, capital, uh, free cash, I believe in this case. Uh, so I'm just going to go quickly go over each item. Um, we have, first of all, we have a Highway F350 pickup for the Department of Public Works. Uh, this is a replacement for a 2006 vehicle with 161,000 miles. Uh, this was supposed to be replaced last year. Uh, we also have fire apparatus and vehicles. And this is for a fire chief vehicle. Um, we also have IT equipment replacement, and uh, this is to replace outdated uh, equipment uh, in the t within the town, plus it's for mon video monitoring equipment for the police and fire station. Uh, replacement of police cruisers. Uh, this is a replacement of two cruisers. Basically, is the town plan that every on a rotating basis, we're replacing two of the older cruisers. System-wide school security upgrades. Uh, this is uh, part of the plan to uh, increase uh, uh, security upgrades at the Elmwood and High School. Uh, I believe there are they are alarms that are outdated. Uh, Hopkins School repl uh, boiler replacement. Uh, this one is twenty. Is this one twenty years old and uh, needs replacement. There's also a middle school water heater replacement. Uh, this is actually part of uh, an insurance uh, claim that was paid, and we need to transfer the money um, from free cash, or it was in the general fund. So this is not new money to, for the water heater replacement. High school athletic center scoreboard replacement. Uh, the current scoreboard does not work well, and a lot of the parts uh, cannot be repaired uh, that need replacement. System-wide system school technology upgrades. Uh, this is uh, replacing obsolete uh, equipment um, within the school system. Uh, most of it is used to replace the I-Pass. Uh, replacement of the uh, tractor at the school uh, department. Um, the current tractor is 17 years old and uh, needs replacement. Uh, and finally, uh, the middle school and high school bleacher upgrades and repairs. Uh, this is uh, to replace uh, unsafe bleachers, uh, I guess, and add a motorized system to uh, protect uh, employees from injuries in the middle school and high school. Okay, any questions? Seeing none, we're ready for a vote. Before you, you have pay-as-you-go items. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. And opposed. And it's unanimous and so carries. Article 14, weed control. Mr. Manning. Mr. Moderator, Article 14, weed control, Lake, Lake Maspinock. The Appropriation Committee recommends no action. And can you explain your vote? Well, this was sponsored by the DPW, but at this point, um, the weed control, whatever was, was in the operational budget for studies, and I, I believe there's no action to be taken on this article. Um, DPW can add additional information on this. Mr. Westerling. 
Through you, Mr. Moderator, this was an article that was placed on the town meeting warrant in the event that the weed committee came forward with a recommendation for treatment for the weeds. At this point, the committee does not have a recommendation, so no action is necessary. Questions? Seeing none, we're ready for a vote. All in favor of no action, signify by saying aye. aye. And opposed? And it's unanimous and so carries. Uh, Article 15, Sidewalk Master Plan. Mr. Manning. Article 15, Sidewalk Master Plan, <coughs> Phase 2. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Uh, Mr. Polico. The Board of Selectmen voted in support of this article. Mr. Oram. Voted to approve as well. Some discussion. And a slide. <coughs> okay, sidewalk master plan. This is a, uh, a program we initiated a few years ago um, in response to resident feedback, and it's, I think it's probably been one of the most successful things we've put in place in the past many years. Um, more sidewalks in town has been consistently rated as one of the most highly desired projects in town by multiple citizen satisfaction surveys. Uh, it always pops up in the top three or four. Um, it was when it was initiated a few years back, we always planned to do it in, in, in multiple phases, um, partly just to sort of work our way through this, probably because it's fairly expensive and, and we wanted to have the ability to control it as we went along. And uh, we put in place phase one. It was particularly focused on addressing some safety concerns. Ash Street in particular, as you all know, has become a very busy road with a lot of folks living on it. We wanted to put sidewalks there. We also did some sidewalks to enhance some of the linkages in town with some of the trails and the schools. That phase will actually be completed this summer. It's about two miles uh, in total length, and it, the cost has been about <coughs> $1.5 million. The article tonight is uh, an ask for $136,000, which is toward the design of almost another two miles, actually slightly more than two miles of new sidewalk. Um, this phase two will provide another set of important connections. First of all, it will complete the access around this, the, the schools cluster by putting sidewalks on two, uh, two more busy streets, which are Holt, uh, kind of a cut through to Hayden Row, and then Granite down on the other side. It will also uh, connect uh, Wood Street and uh, Woodville and Fruit Street to the town center. Um, uh, right now, the sidewalks end uh, right around the DPW garage, and they don't pick up again until the outskirts of Woodville. It, once this is complete, you'll actually be able to walk all the way from the center trail in town all the way down to uh, and through Woodville, actually. Um, and once you get to Woodville, there are actually multiple opportunities to, um, to put in place access to the street, Fruit Street fields. There are <coughs> trails we could do. We could continue down some of the other roads. You have a lot of options at that point. So this is very high-value-added um, sidewalk initiation. Uh, if this is approved tonight, the idea will be to go off and design this plan and come to town meeting in 2017 for full funding. So what does tonight accomplish? It lets us finalize the proposed locations, the distances, all the other things we need to get a really good cost estimate for the town. It's going to allow us to create these final plans. We can then approach developers and some other folks for mitigation funding, some ways to offset this and get some other, um, some of the expense covered. And potentially it could save us some cost because uh, we won't have to bring this entire activity to a full stop until next year. Um, when and if the town approves it, we'll, we'll be able to more or less keep on moving along. So it's, it's, um, there are some cost synergies by letting folks keep going. And for those of you who don't know where Wood Street, Holt Street, or Grand Street are, there's the picture. Um, you can see it's about a mile uh, to going down Wood Street and two-thirds of a mile on Granite Street and about a quarter mile on Holt Street. Um, so again, the idea here is over time, we would like to have a, a, a sidewalk network that really lets us go everywhere in town um, uh, by walking. We're making great progress going south toward Milford. We're making uh, very good progress heading east out toward Legacy. Um, uh, clearly, the, and we're sort of inching our way down Main Street toward 495. Um, again, this will kind of close up the loop around the center of town and also let us go to the last big area that we actually can't get to nowadays, which is Fruit Street. Questions? Mr. Weismantle. Ken Weismantle, Chairman of the Planning Board. Uh, I'd like to point out that the sidewalk survey I thought was still ongoing, and yet we've now picked the locations of where we're going to go with this next phase. I support the engineering funding, but it might potentially some flexibility on 
where exactly we're going to do this because I didn't think anyone came to the conclusion unless I guess it's the last selectman's meeting. Our last planning board meeting, we did not come to a conclusion as to where we thought the next phase should be. Uh, these are these are all on the list. There's been about 200 I believe, responses to the sidewalk survey. We've got some of them, the high ones, but you know, I'm not sure we've done a full analysis as to where exactly it should be. Uh, is there a question in there or directed to somebody that we can uh, get an answer from? We, we have a presentation before us, and yet I guess I'm asking for some flexibility if, if we can complete the process of listening to the citizens about the survey, maybe one of these streets doesn't make the cut. You know, do we have flexibility of, of saying other? I see nothing in the article, in the motion, that would preclude that, but let's have an answer from the selectmen. No, you're right. I mean, this, this is clearly going to be subject to further refinement. Not, nothing you said do I, we disagree with. We've got a special mic for you. It's just, <laughs> can we get that mic working? <laughs> Does somebody turn it off? Now we can get that mic working so that we can get it every place. Quick question. Is there any provisions or plans or thoughts on the sidewalk master plan to push it north of 85? Any plans for going north? <laughs> so the mic was just a premonition of what might be happening. Yes, it's part of the discussion. Uh, there's clearly a desire to get up to Hopkins State Park over time as well. Dave right. Ball, 7 Meadowland Drive. Uh, I totally agree with Ken Weismantel. Um, I do not agree with the streets up there. There's, um, nobody's walking down Wood Street from Woodville to Hopkinton right now, but yet I see Food Street and Spring Street and tons of other busy streets where people are walking very dangerously, lots of traffic. So. I would like to make a motion to strike the street names from this article. I see no street names in the article. The motion as, as listed lists no street names. That was in the presentation. I'm good with that then. I okay. Obviously I, I think that uh, this discussion is heard and, yeah. and, and acknowledged. I support the, uh, the building the sidewalks, just uh, to Ken, Ken's point, let's do it the right way. Uh -huh. um, Darlene, One Third Road, and actually was complimenting again what Ken said. I know that I just recently took the survey, and it's out there in the community, and there was a lot of discussion on sidewalks on Hayward Street, and didn't even see that come up. And with Dell Technologies, those walkers are coming through every day. Mr. Darty, Jeff Darty, Three Angels Way. Um, uh, my question is, or a clarification, is the one hundred and thirty-six thousand dollars for a study? It's not actual work to do the sidewalks? Mr. Polico. Design, repair, maintenance, renovation, improvement, rehabilitation, construction, and reconstruction is what the Thank article you. says. But let's see what they intend. That's it. It's in the article. <laughs> uh, so I guess I have a comment. Um, when Price Chopper was built, we had two uh, developers come before the town and the planning board and it was asked at the planning board meeting that they put a sidewalk in from Downey Street to the development. The developers refused. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people walking on that road. Someone's going to get hit. There's going to be a serious accident there and it's a shame that that isn't part of the project. And if, and if we're talking about remediation from the developer on this particular issue, then I vote for it. Go ahead. Mr. Moderator, David Goldman, 20 Fruit Street. Um, as a resident of Fruit Street, I rarely see anybody walking 
along Fruit Street to the fields on uh, the Fruit Street fields. I would as soon as see speed control on the street because in this particular case, people drive their children to the fields, drop them off and leave. So not only do we have a single round trip, we have two round trips at speeds upwards of 45 to 50 miles an hour. Okay. Uh, Mr. Weismantle. Ken Weismantle, speaking as chairman of the planning board. We're starting to get beyond the low-hanging fruit on these sidewalks. So basically, uh, it's relatively cheap to, to uh, design a sidewalk that all you have to do is kind of put the pavement in and the path in. But uh, a lot of these areas that don't have sidewalks also have wetland obstacles or guardrails or poles that can be doing. And therefore, this money will set up for the engineering for it will allow us to proceed in the future uh, with this. Follow-up question, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Mr. On Fruit Street, there are a lot of properties that have very little access for sidewalks, and most, a lot of the properties have very nice stone walls that would have to be moved. Um, and my comment is trying to move those stone walls, and by the way, Fruit Street is a, is a, uh, a, a um, scenic road, so this would have to be, each and every wall would have, if proposed to be moved to put in a sidewalk, would have to go before the planning board in order to do that. Okay, you have before you a motion for sidewalk master plan phase two. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed. No. And that's a clear uh, majority and so passes. Article 16, transfer funds to purchase fire vehicle and equipment. Mr. Manning. Article 16, transfer funds to purchase fire vehicle, vehicle and equipment. Uh, we move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. Capital improvements. We recommend approval. Uh, discussion, Mr. Polico. Right, real quick slide on this one, folks. This is something we haven't actually done before. So um, articles 16, 17, and 18 are all related. Just going to try to explain the, the higher idea here. Last year at Animal Town meeting, we appropriated uh, $680,000 to replace uh, one of our fire trucks called Rescue One. I had the new chief come in a few months ago, and uh, his conclusion, he had a, he's drawn a couple conclusions, one of which is the town has a high need for a ladder truck. I don't know if everybody knows this, but we don't actually have a ladder truck in town nowadays. If we need one, we get it from Ashland or Milford or somewhere else. Um, and so what he had done was some work and came to us with a concept that we liked that, would, that the town pursue a different strategy, which is as follows. We spend $500,000 to refurbish the existing rescue one, which would allow us to make continued use for it for several more years. That's what Article 16 is about. In addition, we take of uh, that savings, we'd spend $125,000 to purchase a used ladder truck. That's what Article 17 is. And then we take the remaining $55,000 from that 2015 authorization, as well as $45,000 from a prior year authorization, adds up to 100,000 obviously, and we'd use that to refurbish engines two and four. That's what Article 18 is. So the, the summary here, very quickly, this is a revised proposed use of existing authorizations. This isn't a new spending article. And certainly if you have questions for the chief buying the trucks, we can have them up here. We have a question. Go ahead. So, Mandy Davis, three in the circle. Um, just so people know how much of a cost savings this might be to do it this new way, what is the cost of a new ladder truck? Chief. Thank you, uh, Chief Slim. The, uh, Estimate we have right now is about $1.1 million for a ladder truck that would have a pump on it. And we've had a placeholder for about a million dollars for a few years, but it's never been a real ready to buy thing. So that's part of the ask, is we're trying to say in the future, you need to consider a new ladder truck. 
but right now we're able to uh, have some good opportunities and use that ladder truck that gets us into the game of an aerial again. So is everybody clear? Um, oh, we've got another question at the mic. Go ahead. I just want to thank Chief Slayman for coming up with such a great idea, bringing uh, new ideas to the job. Thank you. So our first vote is to approve the transfer from uh, previously appropriated monies, and that requires a two-thirds majority, and that's Article 16. Are we clear? All right. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed. And it's unanimous and so carries. Article 17. Now that we've approved the transfer, let's see what we're going to buy. Article 17, Mr. Manning. Article 17, transfer funds to purchase fire vehicle. We move the motion as printed in the Warren Articles and Motions document. And uh, Mr. Orham. We recommend approval. And you have before you a motion for uh, a new ladder truck. No more questions. I did, I, yeah, excuse me. Used my, a new used ladder truck. Yes. Um, seeing no questions, we're ready for a vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed. And it's unanimous and so carries. Article 18. Transfer funds to re-equip, reconfigure a fire vehicle and equipment. Mr. Manning. Article 18, transfer funds to re-equip, reconfigure fire vehicle and equipment. Uh, we move the motion as printed in the Warren Articles and Motions document. Mr. Orham. We recommend approval. And uh, any questions? And we're ready for a vote again. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed. It's unanimous and so carries. Article 19, Mr. Nine, uh, Mr. Manning. Article 19, purchase of dump truck. Uh, we move the motion as printed in the Warren Articles and Motions document. Mr. Orham. Recommend approval. Uh, and what are we getting, Mr. Manning? This is uh, $200,000 for the purchase of a new dump truck. Uh, the cur this is a replacement for the current dump truck, which has severe corrosion and rotting. Um, and this is one of the larger dump trucks, and it does have a critical use in the winter time for plowing and other uses needs to be replaced. Any questions? All right, you have before us an uh, article for purchase of a dump truck, and it's a two-thirds vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed? And it's unanimous and so carries. Article 20, Mr. Manning. Article 20, Grove Street Water Tank Replacement. We move the motion as printed in the Warren Articles and Motions document. Mr. Orham. Recommend approval. Mr. Polico. Board of Selectmen voted in favor of this article. All right. Uh, what, uh, what are the issues, Mr. Manning? So this is uh, $1,530,000 to replace, I believe, the lining in one of the Grove Street water tank. Replace the tank. So this is out of the Water Enterprise Fund, and um, I guess the DPW can, uh, Mr. Westerling can give more Mr. Westerling, you can, can you give us a presentation? Three, Mr. Moderator. Um, the chairman of the, the Appropriations Committee was spot on. It's $1.53 million. It will replace the smaller of the two water tanks that are out in the parking lot. Uh, that tank is 95 years old. Uh, the existing tank does require about a half million dollars worth of rehabilitation. Um, that, that's all. Of this. <laughs> so, to, so to repair it would cost us upwards of a million? Uh, the existing tank would require a half million dollars worth of rehabilitation. Okay. Do we have some questions? Mr. Why don't you stay there, John, so that uh, questions can be directed to you. Ken Weiss, 145 Ash Street. 
It's just a question on the wording of the motion. It says it is the intent of the town that a portion of the principal of interest on such bonds and notes will be made from the water enterprise fund. I, I, I don't understand a portion of as opposed to like all of it. Should be all of it. Mr. Yes. Miaris, can you answer that? I think it'll be 100% portion. <laughs> <laughs> the 100% portion. Was there any intention for the intent? The intention was to to uh, express the view that it would be paid out of the water enterprise fund, except if for some reason it cannot possibly be it. Uh, Everyone needs to understand that it's still an obligation and will have to be paid out of something. Does that answer your question, Ken? Go ahead. Does it work this time? Yeah, it works this time. Steve Pop gets 24 Cedar Street Extension. Um, did I understand you correctly when you did the little slide that replacing this tank will cost $1.5 million and Repairing the tank would cost half a million. Did I understand that correctly? John? That is correct. Uh, the, what do the, we get for the extra million? What you get for the extra million is uh, a brand new tank. You get a larger tank. Uh, it's also a tank that will require zero maintenance. Uh, it's the, the process is that they fuse glass to the steel on the inside and the outside. So there'll never have to be a need to replace the lining. There'll never have to be a need to repaint it. Um, and it will not corrode or rust. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Sonnet. <coughs> Eric Sonnet, 60 Teresa Road. I guess I'm sort of at a loss here. Does this mean that all the water in those tanks is used for people in the enterprise fund and none of it goes to the town-wide fire suppression system? It seems to me that it's a dual purpose for the tank, not just for the people who uh, are in the water enterprise fund. Mr. Westerling. Uh, you're, you're absolutely correct through you, Mr. <coughs> Moderator. Uh, the tank provides three different types of storage. Equalization storage, which balances supply and demand during the uh, daily operations. Emergency storage for water supply during breaks and contamination, and also fire suppression storage, uh, which is water for firefighting. And to, to, to the financials question, the town reimburses <coughs> the water enterprise fund for, for those elements that they use. So there's, there's money that flows back, that's transferred back from the town to the water enterprise fund. It's not, I mean, the town, right, so the town doesn't pay for the tank directly, but the town reimburses the water enterprise for water that the town uses. Right. The, the, the town's just a rate payer like anybody else. Go ahead, Mr. Oh, Umina. Yeah, Mike Umina, 24 Chestnut. Wouldn't it make more sense uh, when you start spending that kind of money to leave the old tower where it is, fix it, and we'll pay more money and put this, the new water tower someplace else on a high spot in town because the town is basically served with town water in most places now. There are some places that are still, you know, not served. But I think we would be better served to restore that thing, even if it costs 500000 and pay it a little extra now and get another water tank someplace else on a high spot in town. Can we address that? Mr. Westerling, was that Three, Mr. Moderator, if we could have that slide back again, which shows the two tanks, please. Um, the, the water analysis that we had done, which was also peer reviewed, looked to the need for a high pressure system in the future. So what will occur at this site is today with these funds, we'll replace the smaller tank. In the future, when we do the high pressure system, the larger tank will be replaced with an elevated storage tank. The town did purchase land years ago in another location at about the appropriate elevation to service the needs that we have now. However, there's the need to install an additional one mile of water main, and that cost would be exorbitant and would raise this $1.53 million dramatically. Okay, I see we're ready for a vote. 
before you have the Grove Street water tank replacement. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed. And it's uh, unanimous and so carries. Water main replacement, Hayden Rose Street. Mr. Manning. Article 21, water main replacement, Hayden Rose Street. We move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen voted in favor of this article. Mr. Warren. <laughs> Do we have some discussion on this, Mr. Manning? Uh, this is $260,000 to replace the water main on Hayden Row, um, starting at College Street, going to the town line. Um, this, it is old, it's corroded, and it needs to be replaced. Further questions? I see we're ready for a vote. Before you, you have uh, Article 21 for water main replacement on Hayden Row. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. And opposed. And it's unanimous and so carries. Article 22, water source of supply, Mr. Manning. Article 22, water source of supply. We move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. Board of Selectmen. <clears throat> Board of Selectmen voted in support of this article. Mr. Horum, capital improvements. Uh, some discussion. Mr. Manning. This is $1 million to be used for infrastructure improvements associated with the connection to NWRA. I'm going to leave further discussion to uh, Mr. Westerling. Mr. Westerling. Three, Mr. Moderator. This is a $1 million to partner with the town of Ashland to share their capital cost associated with Ashland's connection to the MWRA water main. Ashland's connection to the MWRA will ensure reliable water supply to meet Hopkinton's peak water demands. And it's important to note that Hopkinton's source of water supply will not change. All of our water will continue to come from Ashland's groundwater wells, and we will not become an MWRA community. And when you turn on your tap, we will not receive MWRA water. Questions? Go ahead. Steve Pop was 24 Cedar Street Extension. I'm going to echo on here. Why are we doing this? Three, Mr. Moderator. We yep. have an intermunicipal agreement with the town of Ashland, which allows us to purchase, uh, requires us to purchase a minimum of 300,000 gallons per day and up to a maximum of 1 million gallons per day. When Ashland cannot meet their own demands because their aquifers dry up, just like our aquifers, they're only able to supply us with 130,000 gallons per day, as an example, which happened a couple of years ago. So what this will do is it will allow Ashland to supply its own needs and to give us a source of water supply that we can depend on. So in the summer, when we're in need of water from our own aquifers, which they can't supply, we'll be able to purchase up to a million gallons of water, which we need. Can I ask a follow-on? Go ahead and follow-on. What is, the, what is the current and proposed, current and predicted state of the aquifer? Well, current and predicted state. You said it was drying, that we have had some experience of it drying out at certain points due with our increased use that we've been, with the expansion of the town, the expansion of Ashland. Do we have a uh, analysis of the state of the aquifer as it is now and what it's going to go on to in the future? Through you, Mr. Moderator, our aquifers change on an annual basis based on two things, based on demand and based on rainfall and snow melt. So our aquifers, historically, we cannot supply enough water to meet the town's own demands uh, in the summer, particularly. Uh, the same thing occurs in Ashland. If you drive past their reservoir, you'll notice that that reservoir level lowers. They don't take water directly from there, but that is directly related to their aquifers. So as they drain down, they can't supply their own needs. They can't supply our needs. That's why when we go to them for that 300,000 gallons a day or a million gallons a day, they can't supply us. And again, they were only able to supply us in one instance of 130,000 gallons per day. Go ahead. Frank Durso, 173 Saddle Hill Road. Uh, Director Westerling, can you describe where the aquifers for Ashland are that <coughs> we're talking about? Uh, through you, Mr. Moderator. In general, there, uh, if, if you've seen their water treatment facility, it's basically within that area, around that reservoir. 
Uh, if you've driven Route 85 and you've seen uh, the large body of water on your right-hand side, if you can look across the water body, you'd see a large metal building, and that's where their treatment facility is, and that treats the water that comes out of the ground, basically, in that general area. Mr. Humana. Yeah, Mike Humana, 24 Chesset. Now, am I to understand that we pay for the water that we buy from Ashland? Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Moderator, yes, that is water. correct. Okay. And if we contribute to their connection to the MWRA water main, does that mean that we're going to get that money back or get a, a, uh, a reduction in the rates we pay for the water from Ashland? I'm curious how this deal was structured because uh, it seems to me if they're charging us for the water that we get, that they are then a water supplier to us and they should be absorbing that. Maybe our rates would go up. Mr. How, how is it being managed? I think we've got the question. Right. This million dollars is actually paying. Uh, there's additional infrastructure costs required to make this connection robust enough to support the greater flow. So this, this money is actually intended to, to pay for the upgrades that are solely for our benefit. Go ahead. Dave Ball, Southern Meadowland Drive. Um, I'm not sure of the financial process, so correct me if I'm wrong, but why wouldn't you just increase the rates of the public water users because I do not have public water, I'm on a private well and I just, you know, I had to pay $15,000 to replace my well when it runs dry. Uh, three, Mr. Mr. Westbourne. Three, Mr. Moderator, this will all be borne by the Water Enterprise Fund, this cost. So no, no effect on taxpayers? That is correct. We don't have water. That, yes. It, Go ahead. Taxpayers who do not have water. Correct. <laughs> Go ahead. Carol DeVer, 47 Chamberlain Street. Can you tell me um, when our intermunicipal agreement with Ashland ends? There's a term on that agreement, correct? That is correct. Three, Mr. Moderator. There's yeah. approximately eight years left on that. Okay. Thank you. I see we're ready for a vote. And before you, you have Article 22, Water Source of Supply. All in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. And opposed. And it's a clear, it's a unanimous and so carries. Biological filtration, wells four and five. Mr. Manning. Article 23, biological filtration wells number four and number five. We move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. Uh, Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen voted in favor of this article. Capital improvements, Mr. Orham. We voted to approve this article. Uh, some discussion. Mr. Westerling, can you describe what we're doing? Absolutely. Through you, Mr. Moderator. This is $50,000 for a pilot program to test biological filtration of the water that we receive from Whitehall Wells number four and five. Wells number four and five can only be used during emergency drought conditions due to their high levels of iron and manganese. And if biological filtration proves effective, then up to 828,000 gallons per day of water can become available, reducing our need to purchase water. Uh, this is a pilot program to see if this will work. In the past, in 2004, the town tried another pilot program of green sand filtration, and they determined that that did not work. So this is our next, next best option. Questions? I see we're ready for a vote. All in favor of uh, Article 23 for biological filtration. Uh, on Wells 4 and 5, signify by saying aye. And opposed? And it's unanimous and so carries. Article 24, middle school auditorium upgrades. Uh, appropriations Committee. Article 24, middle school up auditorium upgrades. Uh, we move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. Uh, Mr. Orham. And a uh, quick presentation. Do you, you want to just explain what that is? Essentially, this is $167,000 uh, 
for middle school auditorium upgrades. This will include installing air conditioning, repainting the stage floor. It will replace curtains, rigging, control console, and light board. Questions? Seeing none, we're ready. For, oh, we got one. Uh, what, Henry Steele Hayden wrote, when do you expect this to be done? This would be done over the summer months. Al Rogers, sorry. Okay. This year. And uh, we're going to be borrowing this money. Yes, it is a borrowing. Yeah, it's a borrowing. And so we will start during uh, 2017 to pay for it. Mr. Manning? Starting in fiscal year 2018. Mr. Doherty. Jeff Doherty, Three Angels Way. Uh, so I'm confused. How come this wasn't part of the regular school budget? Um, Mrs. Nickerson. Because it's a capital improvement project. Does okay, that answer thank your you. question, Jeff? Uh, yes, um, and I certainly welcome this, uh, this addition because I'm tired of coming into this hall and fanning myself, <laughs> as I think many town meeting members are also. <laughs> okay, you have before you Article 24. No more questions. All in favor Signify for Article 24, Middle School Auditorium Upgrades? Signified by saying aye. aye. And opposed. And it's unanimous and so carries. Uh, Article 25 was, was uh, that was pulled. It was not pulled. Article 25, school bus parking lot. Mr. Manning. Article 25, school bus parking lot. We move that the town vote to take no action on this article. Capital improvements. We also recommend taking no action. Can you explain your uh, vote? Essentially, uh, this was not recommended by the town manager, but also uh, the fact that this is this is for a parking lot on the Tadaro property, and um, there is a committee formed to establish uses for that property. So, by bringing this to town meeting um, now, before it has been discussed and, and answered by that committee. Uh, it, it should wait until we have something from the uh, use committee. And capital improvements? For the same reason, we wanted to see an overall plan for that property from the mm -hmm. From the school committee, Mrs. Nickerson. Hi, yes. The school committee would like to move forward with this motion and is asking the town to vote no on the motion for no action. And motion that addresses the concerns of both committees. The school committee has looked at this um, and has been asked for years and years about dealing with the new bus parking lot issue. Um, the fact that the new school building is going to be starting clearing the land in early fall, we were hoping that the Tadaro Irvine Committee will have made a decision by that point on whether or not it's appropriate for a bus parking lot. And we'll be able to utilize the fact that the land clearing is happening for the building and possibly have some efficiencies gathered to do the clearing for the bus parking lot at the same time. In the amended motion, we would make this more specific to allow for the fact that this committee needs to have made a decision going forward with the bus parking lot, and also that all appropriate town committees would have had to approve the use of the funds and the use of the parking lot before these funds would ever be used for this purpose. Um, the other thing to note is that there are obvious cost savings that have been estimated for having a bus parking lot in town versus using it outside of town. And so in moving this forward, we would be moving closer to having those cost savings. Hold on just a second. Uh, 
appropriate to have the motion, have her put her motion up, right? Does she have a motion? Yeah. Okay. Do you have, have you uh, given a motion to go uh, I have been prepared to provide, um, the, I just want to make clear that the school committee at this point is, re is requesting the town vote no. Um, okay. I, I am suspecting that the town meeting would like to see what it is you have in its place to, uh, uh, so that they can make an informed decision about their no vote. Is there further discussion? Mr. Durso. I have a comment and a question. Uh, sure. I applaud this effort. I think it's well beyond time we do something like this. Uh, if the Todaro property doesn't work out, um, there's no reason we can't do this, reconfigure the high school parking lot um, and move forward on this. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what these uh, changes are and good luck. Mr. Kanicki. Henry Kanicki, 47 Teresa Road. Does the school committee have a projected cost that you're recommending? I'm sorry, yes. In the amended motion, the estimated cost of the design, and I'm not going to get all of the aspects of that. Design, the bid. Construction. Um, it, it's all in the amended motion, so you'll see it shortly, sir. But it's three hundred twenty thousand dollars. Excuse me. Three twenty. So they want three hundred and twenty thousand. What's missing? They don't have bond council. What section is she referring to? Seven, seven, three, A. We're we're getting an opinion vis-a-vis -vis the appropriateness of the bonding of this. Do we have other questions while this is... Mr. Moderator, yes. Paul Gadudas, 342 Wood Street. Does the school committee have a projection on what the uh, contractual savings would be by parking the buses here in town versus outside of town? Mr. Moderator, through you. I'm Ralph Dumas, the Director of Finance for the School yes, Department. Yes, Ralph, where are you? I can't, it's a disembodied voice. Oh, there you go, all right. So uh, <laughs> this is a, uh, a project that we've been talking about for uh, four years. And uh, for your information, currently the buses are parked in Ashland. As a result, Ashland gets the $15,000 a year of excise taxes uh, for the buses. Uh, in addition, our bus contractor pays $10,000 a year uh, to rent the lot in Ashland. If we had a lot here, uh, we, could, he, we could forego uh, paying uh, as part of our contract for that uh, rental in Ashland. Most significantly, however, is the uh, projected savings uh, related to decreased labor because the drivers, there are 26 drivers, who drive back and forth 16 miles uh, round trip from Ashland to uh, Hopkinton every day. Between the labor and the fuel costs, the expectation is that we would save about $86,000 annually. So when you put it all together, it would have a positive impact to the town of Hopkinton of, of approximately $111,000 a year. 
In addition, by having uh, a lot uh, that we could provide to contractors, we feel as though uh, it would increase the likelihood that, that there would be some competition among bus contractors uh, for our, our work. Uh, for the last couple of uh, bids, um, we've only had one bidder because the, uh, the, the lack of a parking lot is one thing. So if we had uh, a lot, we feel as though comp uh, competition would be there and that would have uh, uh, a likelihood of uh, increasing the benefit to the town of having this parking lot. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I um, just want to make a, a brief point. If before you is a motion for no action, um, if that should be defeated and this is presented, I am going to ask that uh, you make a motion to defer action until tomorrow so that we can have bond council review it to see that it's appropriate. Uh, anyhow, before you is a motion for no action on the um, school bus parking lot. Uh, and I see we're ready for a vote. All in favor of no action? Excuse me? Okay. Before you is the, the article was to make, have a discussion concerning the school bus uh, parking facility. The motion from the Appropriations Committee that was supported by the Capital Improvements Committee is for no action on this article. The things before you are the school committee would ask that you vote no on no action, and they will have a replacement article, which, is, which they put before you so that you knew what you were getting into by voting no on no action. And then uh, following the vote, uh, we, we have some other things that we, we are going to suggest. Yeah, one more question. Yeah, I, now I'm really confused. I'm Steve Popkus, uh, 24 Cedar Street Extension. So what you're suggesting is if we vote in effect yes for the motion, they will amend the motion? No, we'll defer action ask. till tomorrow so that bond council can see the legality of what we're doing. That's all. So if you vote yes right now, the motion is for no action. That will defeat all discussion. If you vote no on no action, that's the same <laughs> as saying, that's the same as saying, all yes. right, we need a replacement uh, are a, a, a replacement motion and the school committee presented their replacement motion so that you could see on what the alternative was. We're not voting on their replacement motion. What we're voting on is whether to take no action now. Is that clear? All right. All right, before you, you have an, uh, the uh, article for the school bus parking all in favor of no action signified by saying aye. Aye. And those opposed? No. Well, the no's are louder, but I don't know whether they're plentier. So let's stretch our legs. All in favor of no action, please stand. Excuse me? And you've got to have your orange pass to be counted. On the stage, I have two for no action. Zero in the center front? Nine. Oh, nine. I thought you said none. Six. 
16 on the left. 16 on my left. Seven on the right. Seven on the right. Four I didn't have to say. Four in the back. Excuse me, 17 on the left. 17 on the left. All right, you folks can have a seat and we'll find out how many are interested from Vote against no action. I have eight on the stage. Center front, eight. Eight center front. Twenty-one on my left. Twenty-two on the right. Twenty-two on my right. Center back, ten. Ten. Twenty-nine to sixty-nine. Oh yeah, I did. I did. Yeah, 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 yeah. What do you have? Two nine four seven seventeen. I get twenty nine out of that. So um, the motion fails. Do we have a replacement motion as seen? Okay. Could I? Uh, I would entertain a motion, Mr. Wisemantle, for to defer action on this till uh, first, article of first article for tomorrow evening. Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed? And it will be deferred. It is deferred till tomorrow. And articles 26 and 27 were part of the... Oh, they weren't. You're right. Ooh. Oh, you can't slip that one by you. <laughs> Storage facility feasibility study, article 26. Uh, Mr. Manning. Article 26, Storage Facility Feasibility Study. We move that the town take no action on this article. 20, 26 was part of the 26. consent. Yeah. That's oh, consent. So you go to never mind. <laughs> 27 is what Because 27 was held. What are the numbers? So 26. 27 was held. What about 20? 26 was part of the consent agenda, so that's all set. So now we'll go to 27. And 28 and, 20, and 29 was held. Uh, uh, just make sure. Okay, 26 was held. Okay. So 26 is okay. 26 is already passed in the consent agenda. No action. Article 27, artificial turf field. Mr. Manning. Article 27, artificial turf field. We move that the town vote to take no action on this article. Uh, capital improvements, Mr. Oram. Uh, we vote to take no action as well. Uh, discussion. All right, you have before us a motion to take no action on the artificial turf field. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed. Okay. And no action will be taken. Article 28, signage for historical sites. 
Mr. Manning. Article 28, signage for historical sites. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Mr. Oram. Uh, capital improvement doesn't have to vote for things less than 25,000. No vote taken, okay. And uh, can you explain your vote, Mr. Manning? Essentially, this is $15,000 uh, to for the acquisition and installation of signs designating historical sites um, around town. Um, this would have been nice if it could be used as for, from CPC funds. Um, just because of the use, it is not allowed on, for CPC, but this is definitely beneficial to the town to have these signs. So we voted for it. Mrs. Wright. Clay Wright, Rep. 28 Hayden Row, represent the, representing the Hockman Historical Commission. Um, this project was presented to the Community Preservation Commission. It received enthusiastic support from them. The idea has been to install, create a Hockman history trail around town. Um, I think I will best explain it by just quickly reading to you what was in our CPC proposal. Um, as historic properties and sites are rehabilitated or significant structures are lost, it's important to keep our history alive with commemorative signage at these locations. Whether it is to mark what was once there or explain the significance of what is there today, historic signage imparts our history to the public and teaches on a daily basis. Some of the sites where the Historical Commission wishes to install informational signs are the restored train depot, the Ice House Pond, and the Ice House site, the Gatehouse at Whitehall Dam, the Stone Bridge at Route 85, and the site of the Old North Mill. Recently, the Trails Committee designed and installed, and installed several historic display signs along the center trail on the old rail bed telling the story of the Hopkinton Railroad. By continuing these historic display signs throughout town, the Historical Commission intends to create a Hopkinton history trail, which, like the Freedom Trail, can be followed through town to our significant sites for a self-guided history tour. And um, as I said, this was fully intended as a CPC proposal. Um, moved through the process towards the very end when town council was brought in to review all the CPC um, recommended funding projects, much to everyone's shock, we found that signage was not allowed as um, Community Preservation Act historic funds. And our friends on the CPC um, were as stunned and upset about this as was the Historical Commission. They recommended we place an article on town warrant to have this funded directly because this is a valuable um, historic resource to raise awareness and improve appreciation um, of our historic resources. And that's where we are. Thank you. Mr. Kanicki from the CPC. Yeah, Henry Kanicki, Chairman of the CPC. Yeah. Claire said it very well. We, we really thought this is a great use for funds. However, the technicalities of the way we're allowed to spend money for, for us to do this, we're allowed to still spend money on signs designating a trail, but not in detail about this historic history and everything else. And we fully support the spending of $15,000 in this. Thank you. Okay. See, we're ready for a vote. All in favor of uh, historic signage, signified by saying aye. Aye. And opposed. And it's unanimous and so carries. Article 29, we have, that, that passed with the? No, that was no. No, okay. Getting my numbers mixed here. Um, transfer of funds, Mr. Manning. Article 29, transfer funds for new capital projects. We move that the town vote to take no action on this article. Okay, capital improvements. Wanted to take no action as well. Discussion? Mr. Manning. 
At this time, there were, there's no need to transfer any funds for new capital projects. Okay. Somebody pulled it. <laughs> okay. All in favor of taking no action, signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed? That's unanimous and so carries. Article 30, Cemetery Roadway Opening. Mr. Manning. Article 30, Cemetery Roadway Opening. We move the motion as printed in the Warren Articles and Motions document. Capital improvements. We do not vote on projects less than 25,000. Oh, so this did not, okay, I see. Oh, right. Mr. Manning, can you explain what we're doing? This is essentially $2,500 um, to be taken from the sale of lots fund to be used for removal and relocation of a section of stone wall on the south side of Mount Auburn Cemetery. This is the parcel that we purchased last year and there needs to be access for vehicles to get in there uh, to mow. So this is $2,500 for that purpose. Okay, uh, and this is a simple majority. Any questions? I know it says two thirds, but uh, initially this was going to be borrowed. Now that it's going to be appropriated, we will. It does only needs a simple majority. Mrs. Wright. Clear Wright Cemetery uh, Committee. Just a correction. It is neither borrowed nor appropriated. This is the Cemetery Commission's money coming out of our sale of lots fund that comes from the sale of lots. So there is no taxpayer money involved. Okay, so it's, it's even better than that. It's a transfer. It's a simple transfer. Okay. That's why it's a majority vote. All, you see before you a motion for uh, the Cemetery Road opening. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed? And it's unanimous and so carries. Article 31. Mr. Kanicki. Uh, I have a, a question. I'd like to move the article as written with one exception. Uh, section D, it says we need two thirds majority. We're not borrowing money for this. We do have money in, the, in, our, in our funds from the land funds for this. I don't know why that that, uh, Mr. Meares, can you explain what we're doing? Whenever you're asking for an appropriation of funds to acquire real estate, okay. it takes a two-thirds vote. It doesn't matter whether it's vote, borrowing or not. Fine, I understand. Okay. Now, are we dividing this question? Is this a divided question? It has to be. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Kanicki. I move the... Uh, the motion as written as basically all that this this is it's, these are projects that come up during the year that we vet, we, we, we review and discuss, and basically we found there's, there's real need for funding on all of these projects. We can go over them one by one, but the, the article is pretty, pretty much where we stand explains what we're doing. We're preserving town records, we're, we're providing some money. $2,500 for boundary markers. These are the signs we're allowed to buy. We have, we're doing a, uh, creating a dog park. We're actually spending $50,000 to create a dog park and improve public trail. Uh, we're acquiring six acres of land for additional trails. And we're refurbing or continuing to refurb the McFarland House with $60,000. And if you drive down 85, if you go north on 85, basically the old stone church, stone bridge, is in disrepair. We really need to repair this thing. Uh, it's in structurally pretty good, good shape. And we basically, all the estimates are that $75,000 will complete the repairs completely on this. And we, to, to do this and continuing the path up, we're spending additional money to take the path from the bridge right up to 85. So we'll be able to walk from 85, continue to get over the bridge, and this will tie in with two bridges that are in South Grove that South Grove is paid to refer. 
Uh, Hank, I'm going to ask that we divide, no, I'm going to divide this question into two articles so that okay. everybody's clear, because half of it will be a simple majority, or, or most of it will be a That's simple fine. majority, and Part D will be a two-thirds, as just explained. So uh, you've gone through most of those. Are there further questions? Yes. Mr. Moderator, Russ Grave, 24 Nicholas Road. Uh, section B. I don't know whether it's a typo or... Russ, can you hold for a second? I, I'm not sure that I uh, heard very clearly whether we had recommendations from appropriations and capital improvements, which we need on these. Or uh, appropriations, excuse me. We've got the Community Preservation Committee. Appropriations, your, your motion? Uh, the Appropriations Committee rec recommends this article at town meeting. And Mr. Oram? Cap okay, and I'm holding D in abeyance and we'll get your opinions on that. Now, Russ, go ahead. Section B, that says $2,500 for medallions, for uh, boundary markers for all town property. Is that a typo? You're going to do that for $2,500? We've got parcels all over this place that have been deeded to the town or given to the town or the town has accepted. And these, how are these? No, this is for markers on, for boundaries and medallions that are required to install on town-owned parcels. It's not all town-owned parcels, but they're specific. We allocate so much money a year for specific parcels that we've acquired, or we put trails through things in that way. Like so, the second trail, we have, we have a marker for that. How many, how many so medallions will go in at $2,500? One, two? about four or five. Okay. Go ahead. Ellen Rudder, Forest, 24 Forest Lane. Um, I don't know how to do this, but I want to find out if we can remove, like amend this to remove some of the recommendations in here. You certainly can. Which okay. ones do you want to remove? Um, I want to remove H. I don't want any fencing around the fountain. And I don't think we need protective netting at the Fruit Street Athletic Complex for $50,000. So you want item H and I. Which, which is the other one? H and I. I. H and I, okay. There you go. So there's a, a secondary amendment to remove H and I. Talking only to the secondary amendment to remove H and I. Is there a second? There's a second. You're right. Yeah. Um, discussion to you. Do you want to say why you want to remove H and I? Well, I feel like that the um, fountain has been restored and it's very pretty, and I don't understand how putting a fence around it is going to um, impact the sort of small town feel it has. And um, so I, I just, I don't. Okay, and I? And I, um, I am at Fruit Street every day pretty much. And as much as I don't like climbing over the fences, it just seems like um, a big expense and it's not that big of a deal to just collect balls that go over the fence. And it's, also, Miss, it's also a safety issue. Miss, uh, Mr. Yeah. Kanicki? You, you have a response to, yeah. to that the, from the, the committee? One, the second one definitely is a safety issue. And uh, when you draw in regards to Section H, I'd like to ask somebody from Parks and Rec. Who oh, okay, we'll get, we'll get. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Eric, uh, Eric uh, Son at 16 Teresa Road, speaking to the fence around Catherine Fountain. The fence in question is an 18 inch high wrought iron fence that will be in keeping with the, with the age and type of fountain that it is. The idea is twofold. One, to separate the garden from the casual passerby so that people realize that they don't have the right to go tramping through the flowers or whatever we do there. It will not be uh, an, obstruct, an obstruct
construction type fence. The other reason is that many parents may come to the conclusion not to let their kids go into the fountain to splash around or climb it. It is a, uh, I guess, sort of a liability issue on our part to at least make it known that people do not have the right to go up to the fountain and use it as if they were in their own backyard. But it's all in keeping with the decor of the fountain. And uh, we had a long discussion about it. We think it's very, very apropos for okay. all the work that's been done on the fountain. Mrs. Altamira. Um, I I'm, couldn't agree more. Uh, an 18-inch fence is just enough to keep the little ones from running through the flowers. And a wrought iron fence is really going to look beautiful around it. Just that little bit of a barrier to keep, to keep you know, flowers safe. I think it's a great idea. OK. Speaking to the uh, amendment to remove uh, sections H and I, Mr. Doherty. Jeff Doherty, Three Angels Way, also a member of CPC. I voted against these two um, sections. Um, the way I was raised, if there was a flower bed, if there was an area that had a special fountain like this, we were taught not to go into that area. You have a huge mulched area that has a planting in it. To me, that's pretty self-explanatory, and I think it's a waste of money to spend $10,000 to put a ring around that circus. Behind you. Frank Durso, 173 Saddle Hill Road. Um, I'm a coach in uh, youth soccer, and the balls do go over the fence. The kids have to go chase them. I don't see the spending $50,000 to stop the kids going over the fence. They, they, there's no bears and wolves in the woods. It's just uh, weeds and trees and branches and stuff. That's not going to really hurt them. Uh, that's a big feel, too. If uh, $50,000, you know, we pay a lot of dues to play there. Uh, we're going to be paying $50,000 off for a long time. Mr. Moderator. Mr. Sana. Mr. Moderator, the netting is a safety issue. It's more for the lacrosse uh, field than it is the soccer field. And it's to protect the area of the parking lot and the area uh, where the uh, uh, people will accumulate prior to going on to the field. It's a definite safety issue. Virtually, virtually every town with uh, lacrosse fields and things of this nature has protective netting. I think we're at real risk by not having it. So before, before you, you have an amendment to remove items H and I, uh, I see no more comment. Oh, we got one more. Uh, I, uh, neighbor Pucci, 8 Robin Road, a uh, question about the safety of lacrosse. So you cited the other towns have it, but do you have any studies that cite that there's a danger? Have we been brought up in legal issues about the risk of that? Uh, just like so that's, a, that's fields, a quick question. Baseball fields, we don't have protective netting around. You know, cars get smashed windows occasionally. I don't understand why $50,000 needs to be spent on something that... Mr. Sonnet, can people. you answer his question? Well, I'll start by saying the Red Sox just screened their entire Fenway <laughs> Park for safety issues. Virtually all parents who have children on teams that go to other towns or the travel teams have requested it. They all know anyone that's been uh, to a field like that has seen the netting and understands why it's a safety issue. Okay. All right. I see we're now ready for a vote. We have items H and I. We're just voting on the amendment. Uh, no. No, we're not. I would just suggest that you take them separately. Some people may be in favor of one but not the other. The, What? So, divide, divide, divide the amendment. Wow. 
We're getting down into fancy parliamentary stuff. We can divide the question. Okay. We, we can, we can, I'll just do that. We'll vote first on item H. And that is the item to put a uh, fencing around the Claflin Fountain. To remove that, uh, the, the item was to remove that from the CPC uh, funding. All right? So if you are in favor of having fencing, you vote no. If you are against having fencing, you vote yes to the amendment. All right, so before us is the amendment to remove item H from the CPC article. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed. And uh, that clearly fails. Item I, before you, you have the, uh, well, can, sure. Um, it's just a simple majority for an amendment. All right, all in favor, please stand. Now, these are the folks that want to remove item H from the uh, article. And we have one on the stage, two on the stage. Oh, three on the stage. <laughs> Center back four. Four in the back. Eighteen on the right. Eighteen on my right. Center front nine. Nine on the front. Eight on the left. Eight on the left. And those opposed to removing the article, the uh, section from the. I have uh, seven, seven on the stage. Seven on the right. Seven on my right. Eleven on the front. Center back, nine. Nine on the back. Thirty on the left. Thirty on the left. So that the amendment fails forty to sixty-four. For excuse me, forty-two to sixty-four. Now you have before you item I. Uh, and that's for the protective netting. Uh, all in favor of removing I from uh, Article 31, signal, that would take it out. All those in favor of removing I, uh, which is for protective netting, uh, signify by saying I. Aye. And opposed. No. And that clearly fails. So they're both stay in now we can vote okay sure not a problem stretch your legs again so now we have I on the stage I have one back. Seventeen on the right. Seventeen on my right. Center front 
Nine in the front. Eight on the left. Eight on the left. All right, you folks can have a seat and those who are opposed, please stand. I have nine on the stage. Nine on the front. Seven on the right. Seven on my right. Center back, ten. Ten on the back. Thirty on the left. Thirty on my left. So that too fails, 38 to 65. Yeah, we concur. So now we're ready to vote on the main article. Excuse me? Sure, point of order. Point of order, I'm still waiting to speak on other points of the main article. Okay. And there's a fellow behind me who's got okay, other I'm, points to speak on. Okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. I All right, didn't my concern. The mics. Ah, hi, I'm Wendy Zimmerman, 24 Cedar Street Extension. Go ahead. My concern is F and G, related to the beautiful old bridge on 85. Now, I really like the idea of us restoring it, and I would, and I would love to go walking across that footpath, but when 85 was moved, ownership of the roadbed and the bridge reverted to the abutters. The abutter uh, who owned the fragment, what, the little piece of land between old 85 and new 85 donated the land to, to the town. The, uh, the abutter on the west did not. That means the town only owns one half of that bridge. The property line runs down the middle. So you're asking us to vote on something without first getting approval of the other property owner. Are we talking about taking land from one of my neighbors? I am really uncomfortable with this as it is written. I think someone has not done their homework. And I would Let's like to move get you an that they get removed for further consideration after the appropriate eyes have been dotted. So you want an amendment to remove item G? Uh, well, do we have a second? Okay. You can speak to the article. You you spoke to it, Mr. Kanicki. Southborough owns the 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 north end of the bridge. We've been working with the town with the CPC in in Southborough. We're going to do structure on the bridge. They're, they're voting money to do the railing and restore the, the iron railing on the top of the bridge, plus other, other things that have to be done. Plus, they've also agreed to restore the two other bridges that are on their side. So we'll all be up, brought up to date now, so we don't have any problems in the future. In the past, we have done this ourselves. Hank, I, I, I want to cut into it here. Can you first answer her specific objection about the ownership? The, owner, the ownership is clear. It is Southborough has part of the bridge. We have the other half. And we have been working with Southborough. Excuse me, the property line runs along the center of the bridge. The state determined that when it, went, when it was redoing the train station. You only own half of the south of the bridge. Okay. Uh, do we have a clear answer to that, one way or the other? I, uh, you're certainly yes. sure of your, your information, it would seem. Uh, has that been vetted by uh, the town? It has not. It's part of the town park. I mean, we've had control and ownership of that for years. Uh, 24 Cedar, Stephen Pop is 24 Cedar Street Extension. May I respond to that? I, I, I think we're going to get clarity somehow. Yes, give it a shot. Um, we're one of our good friends are the Boyces who live uh, as one of the abutters on that, and they have in their deed half of that bridge. And so you should talk to the Boyces 
before you consider this. And that's uh, totally new information. It was never brought up to any of the public hearings that we had on this also. We okay. Went, we went uh, no, 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 okay. <laughs> May I add a follow-up, sir? Do a follow-up, yeah. About 15 years ago, I think, they put asphalt across the middle of the bridge, if you'll recall, uh, in an attempt to make the bridge. Before they put in the, the re-changing re of 85, they put asphalt to run it up to the, up to the 85 as a sidewalk. That had to be removed because the voice is objected to it. So I really think you need to do some more homework on this. I really respectfully would move yeah. that F and G be removed from this from this article at this time. Well, we're we're only talking about G. You got another well, shot at F in a second. Both of them, F and G, no, both apply to this. Oh, you said both? Yes. Oh gosh, we're going to have to do this again. Okay, yeah, go ahead. All right. May I add one last thing? Sure. Uh, I have no objection at all to the intent of this article. Zero objection to that. I just need to be done legally. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Sounds like uh, it's going to wait for another year. <laughs> Mr. Kanicki, yes. uh, do we have anybody that, that knows anything about the ownership? That never came up. It never came up. So okay. You know, we, we, we had been, the town has returned that bridge in the past. So, this is, as I said, new information for okay. our, our, our committee. So, any more discussion to the amendment to remove F and G? Go ahead. Steve from Leader 39 Sanctuary Lane. Mr. Chairman, due to the lateness of the hour and the confusion that surrounds this, and the, uh, the help that may be. Uh, some reflection tomorrow by legal counsel on this. Would this be a good point to uh, break the meeting? So you're making a motion to adjourn Second. and yeah. resume yeah. our discussions yeah. as yeah. the beginning yeah. of tomorrow's yeah. meeting at 7 o'clock? I would make that motion. Okay. Is there a second? Second. And that motion is in order. And uh, what? So we need to vote on it, though. 7 o'clock tomorrow was the motion that I heard. All in favor of adjournment till tomorrow at, and opposed. And 31. We can. The school one goes first and then this would go second. Okay. Just for a clarification, we had, uh, we had already voted to have the school article spoken to first <laughs> sorry sorry Hank so it is what it is